Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee. And if everyone can do the necessary with their electronic devices and um, mute themselves accordingly um, on the Starley facility and, and come in and out as you engage with us on that. Uh, any declarations of financial or relevant interests related to the business being transacted today, now is the appropriate time to declare it. If not, we'll move on. Um, then, if members are content, the oral evidence sessions, they'll be reported by Hansard. There's apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan, and we should be joined by uh, Linda, Doug, uh, Gemma and Rachel, and I think Sinead is there too, yes, uh, all by the Starley facility, and of course you're all very welcome. So, um, if the clerk can just indicate any delegation of votes, please. Uh, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote under standing order... Sorry, 1156 to yourself and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Then the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 4th of March, um, pages 5 to 14 of the meeting packet. If members are content that they're a true reflection, then I can sign them accordingly. Members content? Done. Okay, um, then just some matters arising. Item 1 is uh, Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. The PPS has replied to the committee's request for its view on what might be appropriate and acceptable statutory time limits following the oral evidence session on the 11th of February this year on the bill, and those papers are in the meeting pack. The PPS has provided a copy of its response to the DOJ consultation in respect of this issue from 2015-16, and says that its views remain the same. The PPS does not consider that statutory time limits are likely by themselves to lead to an improvement in case um, cases uh, processing times, and notes that reports since then on the issue of delay in criminal cases have not recommended their introduction. In relation to custody time limits, the PPS states that it has limited experience of how these operate, and the, the department has never consulted on them. Uh, the PPS has reservations as to whether they would be effective in addressing delay that are similar to those that it has relating to statutory time limits for cases. So if members are content, we'll note the information provided. It will be added to the electronic bill folder and bill web pages, uh, and obviously it will be there for members to refer to in the future. Um, the second item on matters arising. The Minister has written advising that the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill received royal assent on Monday the 1st of March. The Department is working with the partners towards the new offence coming into force before the end of the year, and which will allow for a uh, crucial period of training, uh, awareness tra raising and system changes that are needed ahead of the offence going live. The Minister has indicated that she will keep the committee updated on progress. Uh, that letter is in the tabled pack. The committee agreed at last week's meeting to request an update on progress with the work on training, system changes and awareness raising in September. So if members are content, we will note this correspondence. Um, then the next item is item three around the oral evidence session on the DOJ budget outcomes and priorities. It was agreed at last week's meeting a further oral evidence session uh, with officials on the budget and priorities would be scheduled for the 15th of April. The clerk to the Finance Committee has since advised that the final budget, budget settlement is expected to be announced by the end of March and suggests that committees may wish to consider scheduling an oral evidence session with their respective departments for the last meeting in April, and that would be the 29th as this should allow departments time to consider their plans in light of the budget settlement. The Committee for Finance is likely to ask statutory committees to provide their responses on the budget by the end of the first week in May, and those responses are expected to be uh, published. So if members are content, we will reschedule the budget briefing from the meeting on the 15th of April and to either the 22nd or the 29th, depending on when the department indicates the most suitable timing for the briefing. So if members are content, we'll reschedule that briefing accordingly. Okay, content then. Agenda item four. Legal services officials are attending the meeting today to provide an update on progress to implement the Northern Ireland Audit Office and Public Accounts uh, recommendations in relation to the management of legal aid and specifically the findings regarding fraud and error in the Business Consultancy Service interim report of its review of processes, governance 
and structures in legal aid in Northern Ireland and the agency's official error in legal aid payments in the 2019 end of year report. The relevant uh, papers are pages 59 to 127 of the meeting pack. So can I welcome uh, Paul Andrews, Chief Executive, and Mandy uh, McKay, uh, Director of uh, Operations in the Legal Services Agency, and uh, delighted to have both of you here physically with uh, the committee um, to the meeting, so that avoids any technical glitches on, on your part. Um, so uh, the session will be recorded by Hansard and a transcript will be published in due course. So Paul, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage, um, if you can give us a briefing and then members, I'm sure we'll take it from there. Thank you, thank Chair, you. and thank you for your welcome and introduction, and it's a pleasure to see people in the, in the flesh these days as opposed to on screen. Um, Mandy and I very much welcome the opportunity to brief the committee on the work of the agency and what we're doing to address the audit qualifications on our accounts and embed a performance culture. Mandy and I, together with our colleague Nuala McCauley, have been the senior management team within the Legal Services Agency since November 2019. Notwithstanding the challenges in delivering a public-facing service during the pandemic, the issues before us today have been and remain part of our core priorities. I want to take the opportunity of maybe dealing with three central issues rather than jumping into the detail of the briefing paper, if that is a helpful, Chair. Yeah. First, I take the opportunity to deal with uh, the issue of the duration of the qualifications. Secondly, our commitment and progress to date to address the qualifications. And thirdly, maybe say a little on the journey that we are currently on. As you will be aware, the legal aid accounts have been qualified since 2003 when the Legal Services Commission was established. Before 2003, legal aid was administered by the Law Society of Northern Ireland and the annual accounts were presented on a cash basis and the accounts were not subject to formal certification by the Controller and Auditor General. With the establishment of the Legal Services Commission, it came the need to present accounts on an accruals basis, which necessitated estimating a provision for outstanding liabilities at each year end. In the early years of the Commission, there was a dispute about the appropriate accountant treatment for those provisions. This was resolved for 2010-11 accounts, and since then, the qualification and provisions has revolved around the evidence to support the key assumptions and judgments made. In many ways, to break out of the cycle of the provisions qualification, we needed to change the landscape to remove the reliance on assumptions and judgments. The agency's new case management system provides that fundamental change and opens the way for the qualification to be removed. I'll return to that point, no doubt, shortly. In respect of the fraud and error qualification, historically the Legal Services Commission, due to its size and skill base, did not have the capacity or capability to put in place robust and demonstrably independent arrangements to address this qualification. This is why the agency developed a partnership agreement with the Department for Communities to take a shared service from its well-established and independent standards assurance unit, which has a proven methodology in this area. The agency is working closely with the Standards Assurance Assessment Unit and there is a challenging and robust programme of work in hand to address the fraud in our qualifications. If I may turn briefly to comment on our commitment to address those qualifications, I want to take this opportunity to state clearly and unwaveringly, unwaveringly our commitment to address these qualifications. Good progress has been made on the work to address the provisions qualification. In his media release on the agency's 2019-20 accounts, the Controller and Auditor General said, progress has been made on estimating provisions to provide a more robust estimation of the agency's legal aid liabilities. A new case management system has been established this year, and when this has had a chance to fully bed in, it should provide the agents, improve the agency's ability to prepare these estimates. The nine month accounts for the 2021 period have been submitted to the NIAO. These accounts, in these accounts, the estimated provisions have been driven through the agency's new case management system. This addresses the extent to which the provisions model was reliant on assumptions and judgment. 
Work which is in hand to review old cases which have not been reported as closed will further strengthen the evidence base for these estimates of future liabilities which will have to be met on foot of legal aid certificates. Can I comment on whether the CNAG will remove this qualification uh, in 2021, but I am confident that we have made significant strides to that end. In respect of fraud and error qualification, the committee will recall that the CNAG also commented that some progress has been made by the agency and the department in developing an effective counter-fraud strategy. However, further work is needed to produce an estimate of fraud and error by legal aid claimants and legal practitioners. The committee will note from the background briefing that official error, as measured by the Standards Assurance uh, Unit, is well established now. Indeed, the committee will have noted that in the agency's last annual report, the CNAG indicated that he was satisfied that the approach was reasonable. One final point on official error at this time. I want to be clear with the committee. We are conscious that errors mean over and under payment of public funds. As such, we do not consider the estimated error rate of 11.1% as reported uh, for 2019 to be acceptable. Once uh, we move forward, our focus is clearly now to drive up our accuracy rate and to do this on a consistent basis. There's a significant body of work in hand to do just this, but I will not comment further at this time. In respect of applicant fraud and error, the committee will note that this work would have been more advanced but for COVID. However, we have set out in the background papers the array of work already in hand and about to be delivered. While the CNAG will comment on this in due course, I am co confident that the approach is appropriate as it is based on a tried and tested method developed in testing recipients of benefits and will be conducted by the Standards Assurance Unit. I must, however, sound one note of warning in respect of measuring applicant fraud and error. That is that the formal sample will be taken from closed cases, so we can review the applicant fraud and error throughout the life cycle of the case. This increases the probability that, as cases have been concluded, some or perhaps many assisted persons may fail to cooperate and this will result in errors being deemed, which may result in a level of error being overstated. We are working with the Law Society and also the advice sector to stress the importance of cooperation as it could result in certificates being revoked and individuals becoming liable for the cost of their case. The final area of work is practitioner fraud and error. Again, the detail of our approach is set out in the background briefing. To measure practitioner fraud and error, we need to look at individual files and to assess the compliance of good practice therein. However, uh, a more holistic and analytically driven perspective is required in this area, but the file review will provide insight into fruitful areas for future review. <coughs> Finally, Chair, if I could come to the journey we are on, I would like to make a very simple point, but there is no simple or quick fix to fraud and error in the legal aid system. Indeed, it will be a cyclical approach as official, applicant and practitioner fraud and error rates will change at different rates and the exposure of a few significant cases can distort trends over time. However, we have set out a series of measures we are taking which we will continually refine to ensure that they are effective in delivering sustainable reductions in the overall error rate. If the committee would find it helpful, we will, of course, provide periodic, periodic updates on the progress that we are making. Chair, I'd like to take the opportunity of thanking you and the committee for your patience in allowing me to make a slightly longer statement, but I, I trust that the, the background and context may be of assistance. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul, and no, no need to apologise for that at all. Um, we've had much longer <laughs> statements um, <laughs> on other issues, and it's, it's good to be dealing with something that isn't just to do with legislation, which the committee has been uh, heavily engaged in. Uh, and this is one of the, the few areas that we've had an opportunity to explore. And I know from previous experience, as do some colleagues, this is a kind of deja vu moment, I suppose, for a lot of us that we've looked at this and indeed went into a lot of detail in previous mandates around it, um, um, but obviously it continues to be an issue that we're um, wanting to, to try and grapple with. Um, 
and I suppose it's trying to identify what you've said yourself. It's difficult just to precisely um, have a silver bullet that makes this issue go away. And, and all walks of life we're having to deal with fraud and area and, and, and so on with public um, expenditure. Um, but it is one of the issues related to the kind of fee structures. So where you've got a standardised fee system, there's less likely to be fraud and error. Where you don't have a standardised fee system, and maybe that's not still as much of an issue as it was in the past, is that part of the problem? Well, Chair, I'm grateful for the question because you've introduced the what can you do for me comment I was hoping to introduce at some time. Uh, and in essence, the point that you make is critical because the more complicated, the more diverse a system is, the more pro prone it is to difficulties. Uh, Mandy and I were talking about a, a simple illustration, and again, some members of the committee will, will feel the pain of this, but over the years there have been several changes to the Crown Court rules. So an assessor could be sitting looking at a, a series of Crown Court claims. They may be all essentially the same type of case, but because they started at different points, there's actually different fee arrangements that impact on each of those claims, so you have to make sure you've got the right set of rules that relate to that claim. I think the other thing that is a, an issue, and this is one of the areas where when we talk about the official error, we talk about uh, deemed error, that is where there's not sufficient evidence to either say it's right or it's wrong. And that is sort of the evidence base, because the more the fee structure, and this is also true of standard fees, Chair, the more that the fee structure has little add-ons which require evidence to support someone's entitlement to it, then the, the more vulnerability it has to either the person being entitled to the fee but not being able to prove it, or us saying, well, actually, we think that's fair enough based on the evidence that we have, and our SAU colleague saying, but that's not quite the evidence that you need to pay that fee. So I, I think part of the landscape, uh, I'll probably talk to you that we have been trying to put in detective controls to see what is going on, preventative controls to stop things happening in the future. But there's an aspect of directive controls which says in future manifestations of new remuneration arrangements or even financial eligibility arrangements, we, we want them proofed so that they simplify the process and avoid the possibility of fraud and error. I, I know we can never remove it, but we need to minimise it as far as we can. So I think we're with you in the principle of it, but even in standard fees, you do get these little hooks yeah. that say that evidence isn't quite what you needed to pay that fee. Yeah, yeah, and I, I understand that. Um, and I know in the past, um, previous mandate, we sought the police to look at all of this and they were like, um, at the end of the day, it's your, your accounts, as my assessment of it, are being qualified because there's a lack of evidence yes. to substantiate claims as yes. opposed to criminal activity yes. having taken place. Um, and that's, that's part of the, the fundamental problem of it all. In terms of the, the testing of the practitioner's error, that's being introduced then. We have actually de on that. To, we have developed a, a program and the program is really aimed at trying to get a solicitor or a barrister's file in when they submit their bill for payment because we think that's the best way to do it. Um, and then to look at what happened in the file and if I could put it rather simplistically, we want to see is there any evidence that hadn't been shared with us which, if it had have been shared with us, may have changed whether the person received legal aid in a civil context, or we should have been put on notice that the case could have come to a conclusion but went beyond that point, and because it went beyond that point, may have cost us more money than it otherwise would have. Uh, again, we'll look to see, is there evidence, for example, for consultations, because that's one of those add-on fees that you can get. You can't evidence that from a court record, mm -hmm. but is there a, an attendance note on the file? Is, is there an evidence base to support it? Now, that takes us so far, Chair, but on an individual basis, a file is unlikely to show 
I think, as you said to me, proving a fraud is a difficult thing uh, in, a, in a previous meeting. But it might show a pattern, which actually means that you need to go and look to see where that pattern takes you. you. There may, of course, be something in the file that of itself causes concern and needs to be investigated. But I suspect for the practitioner fraud in our what we would like to do is to be able to say all the work was properly done, there was nothing withheld from us, and I think that's why the professional bodies are actually supportive of changing the narrative that there's evidence bases to show that the legal aid system works well and appropriately, and if there's adjustments that need to be made, then they can be made. And each month, Mandy and I meet with colleagues from the Law Society and the Bar, and we go through the issues of the month, and we go through, well, why are we rejecting some payments? Why are we rejecting? What are the lessons that we can get out there? And there's a monthly update that goes out to practitioners. So you're, you're trying to build a narrative yeah. that says, actually, we want to be able to prove the positive yes. of what, what goes on. And if we find other things, we deal with them appropriately. Yeah. Okay, I, I have some more questions, but I do want to open it up for other members um, if they want to come in at this stage and to indicate. Um, please do so. I'm not seeing anybody at this stage indicating on my screen. Okay, so if Rachel Woods and then Paul Frey. Rachel. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you, Paul, for your uh, presentation and also the um, information that we received um, was very, very helpful. I just want to start off with, you mentioned something earlier on and also in the briefing paper about deemed error. Could you just go over what that means again so I'm clear? Well, I'll maybe say a few words on it and then maybe ask Mandy to give some practical illustrations. Uh, when our colleagues from uh, SAU look at a case, they, they want to establish that the payment is in accordance with the legislation or that the assessment of someone's financial eligibility is in accordance with the legislation. So if they find that we have done something which is not in accordance with the legislation, that's an error. However, if they find that in part of the case, this would typically be with payments, but not exclusively, that there's a piece of evidence which is required to support the payment, and that evidence isn't there, they will say, well, we can't say positively that is right. We certainly can't say it's wrong, but with the absence of that piece of clarity, they'll say, we're going to deem that as an error. They, they will give us an opportunity to see if there is an evidence base that we can provide. But maybe, if you don't mind, Rachel, I'll ask uh, uh, Mandy, who deals with these things day and daily, to give a, a practical illustration. Yes, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. So the legislation um, for maybe travel and mileage um, would provide for a starting point of whether it be um, the Bar Library or the Belfast Post Office. If we have accepted a claim and paid it without that type of information and assumed that somebody has travelled from where they have said, then in the absence of such information, then the SAU would say that that claim had not been properly verified. That would be one case. Um, another instance would be potentially where um, somebody has claimed a fee for attendance at court and we have not verified it through the ICOS system, or, which is the court system for the court record log, and we have not confirmed that they're on it. And when SAU have checked it, they may not be on it. Now, that can just be an oversight by a court clerk. So um, stressing again what Paul said about the need for us always to have the evidence base is very, very um, important. And SAU will raise a query with us and will give my staff the opportunity to go back to the practitioner and ask them to provide that information. Um, the issue probably at the minute, Rachel, is, is that the case is closed and paid. And with the pandemic, it's quite difficult because a lot of people are out of their offices to get that information. But we have built a robust process now. And we now not only um, email and message, but we actually phone practitioners. Um, so we're trying to drive down the deemed errors completely. And I have to say, as Paul says, um, one of the ongoing dialogues with the Bar and the Law Society 
and that they're supporting us in is in getting practitioners to engage with us and provide that information because it's within all our interests to drive this down and we're working together on that. So that's very clearly deemed there. One other issue is if the agency don't respond to a query within 28 days, then we're automatically deemed. Um, I have to say, I don't see any reason why we would never be able to deliver on that. And in the past, we might have, but again, we've put robust processes in place um, and we check that that's followed up um, on all outstanding queries. And I think, Rachel, if I just may cast your mind back to the briefing paper, and if it was too much, I apologise for that. But uh, when the official error report was published, for the, it's a calendar year as opposed to a financial year, 2019. Uh, if, if we look at the overall percentage, it was 11.1. But Table 7 in the report says, if you take out the deemed error, that is the cases where you, you can't prove it's either positive or negative, that comes down to 7.7. .7. So I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying that 7.7 .7 is where I want to land either, but I'm making the point that actually aggressively attacking the deemed error does have a significant impact on the overall assessment. And it, it's part of the investment that we need, and we need the profession to put in alongside us to drive this down. Well, absolutely appreciate that and thank you very much for those very helpful examples. Uh, it certainly makes a lot more sense um, now. Um, just also on, on seven, I appreciate um, this is all an unofficial error, but there was a figure of approximately two million of underpayments. Yeah. Could you be able to elaborate on that and what does sort of that mean? And and, and once a, a, a pay, you know, a sort of uh, a, claim has been closed, can, you know, and, there's, and then if there's an underpayment identified, can that then be paid the following year, or how does that work? Well, uh, I'm happy to do the same and do a double team with Mandy on this, because in, in reality, uh, I suppose historically, um, if you go back over the years, if a practitioner didn't claim something, they weren't paid for it. Whereas what the Standards Assurance Unit are saying is legally, they're entitled to a payment because clearly they were at court on that day. The court record shows it. They didn't put that in, so they are still entitled to that payment. Uh, and I, I accept that principle because people are entitled to be paid for the work that was done in accordance with the regulations that have been passed. So it may well be that when SAU are looking at an individual case, they'll see that there's an attendance in court recorded against that solicitor or barrister, but it's not claimed for. So according to the rules, they would be entitled to a payment. They will raise that as a query. And then if we accept that finding, what we'll do is we will make good the underpayment that has been made. Uh, Amanda, I know, has got some figures on the you know, how those under and overpayments that are reported in Table 7 have been dealt with. So, Mandy, would you uh, like to say a word about that? Yeah. Sorry, Rachel, I'm just flicking through my figures here. Um, so was, I have them. Um, as Paul actually rightly says, so mostly it was um, the way we were actually approaching um, the assessment of claims. So if you didn't claim, you didn't get paid. SAU are totally, if you're entitled, you should be paid everything you're entitled. And that is mainly where the underpayments have been. Or if somebody has claimed um, for one court appearance, um, but there was others on the ICOS record. And when we went in and checked the court record, um, there was other occasions that at, um, that solicitor or barrister had been at court, then they would have been entitled to have been paid for those, and we should have actually invited them to claim for those dates that were missing. So we have um, repaid all the underpayments already, um, and obviously we can't clarify um, all underpayments and overpayments until the end of the SAU year. So we're only doing them at this stage because obviously we were a bit late with SAU being able to report to us this year due to COVID. Um, but this will be an annual exercise then because really when SAU um, 
assess, they don't close the books until the cut-off date for the full year. So if I can correct anything, so say they sample something in January and they raise a query and the practitioner comes back to me in December and I have the information, I can go back to SEU and they will correct that. So there is a process around that and that's why it goes back to it's really important to get the information in and then basically we will correct all the underpayments which we have already done and then we are already in recovery of the overpayments and we've written out on all of those ones that we're going to recover. So as you said, there were 232 underpayments and we have paid out circa 39,500. Mm -hmm. There were 239 overpayments but they're broken down into 128 that were recoverable and 111 that are non-recoverable. And the non-recoverables are because of um, mainly some policy legacy issues within the agency whereby we had um, not been applying the statutory time limits for a claim. So we've revised our late claims policy um, since last October and now everyone um, is in line with the legislation. So we had paid people on the basis of the agency's policy at the time. So our judgment and a recorded decision is, is that it wouldn't have been appropriate to, pay, to ask the practitioner to pay back something with the agency was holding as their policy at that stage. There was other um, issues in terms of amendments to the remuneration order. So the order was corrected, uh, or it had amendments made in 2019, but there was an error in it, whereby um, basically the person could claim for a letter per item originally, and there was a typo which said in the new legislation per hour. That meant that we as an agency continued to pay in line with our policy per item. When SAU came along and looked at the legislation, it says per hour. The policy intention was always per item. It still is per item and it's now corrected and we have had that in writing from the department. So those are the sorts of practical examples where we've made a judgment call that actually it wouldn't have been fair on the practitioner to ask them to repay on something that the, de the department and the agency were both holding a line, both in legislation and policy terms. But again, we've moved to correct those matters for the future, um, and we've put you know, a new late claims policy in place. Um, we've obviously, um, as I say, adjusted and amended the legislation and we've also corrected all of the practices in terms of travel and mileage. And I think that's a very good example, Chair, of the robustness of the SAU system because even though we all know that, for example, if uh, travel and mileage had disappeared from what was payable for a solicitor going to a family proceedings court, um, if I hadn't have paid it, I would have been judicially reviewed, and guess what? I would have lost, because when the rules were brought to this committee, it was said it was on a no-detriment basis. So the very representations that were made to the committee would have meant I would have lost the judicial review. So we take the error sometimes because actually we're doing the right thing, uh, and we try to then avoid the error being repeated by changing the legislation, and that was, of course, done. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, Chair, I just have one more question, sure. if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't be a justice committee or me at it without me mentioning the domestic abuse bill um, and also Section 28. So um, I was just wondering if you have any update on Section 28, any work or business case that's going on with that. And also another issue that came up during the deliberation of the bill, um, and it was on the use of Article 10 of the Civil Legal Services Regulations 2015 and the waiver of financial eligibility limits for civil legal aid uh, for applications of non-malls. Um, and the figures that I would got from the department were quite um, concerning, showing that since 2010 there were only 287 recorded incident instances of domestic violence waiver being granted, um, but there had been 
52,000 um, give or take non-mall orders made um, according to that written answer. So I just wondered, is there any work going on within legal services agencies regarding um, the applications and, and the domestic uh, violence waiver with that? And then finally, just as I said at the start, be uh, any update on works going on with Section 28? Uh, uh, I'll take your Final sentence first, Rachel. Uh, I, I think I could give you exactly the same answer as the AQ gave you in response to that quite recently. Department colleagues are looking at the, uh, the economic appraisal based on the um, legal advice, and uh, that, that's where it sits. It's not that part of work, piece of work. It's not currently with the agency. Uh, moving to the, the other question about non-walls, uh, Having contributed to the answer that you're referring to, uh, I think you will remember the caveat that was in it in terms of the information that was lifted from the LAM system, which is uh, reliable and transparent. Uh, my own feeling about it, Rachel, is this, that we are not refusing people uh, legal aid under the waiver, but some people may not be applying for legal aid. Now, to address that, uh, and I'm, I'm, if, if the standard assurance unit were here, they would say that's a deemed error because I can't prove that. But uh, if, you, if, I'm allowed to, if I'm allowed to make the point, what we did was we sent out, as part of the key messages that I mentioned to the chair, uh, we sent out reminders to um, practitioners that that waiver is available uh, and can be utilised. And I reminded my own staff that if there's a case that comes in where someone doesn't apply for the waiver, but the case is eligible for the waiver, that we should proceed and apply the waiver where it's appropriate. So um, I'm not inviting a second AQ, uh, Rachel, but over a period of time, I suspect that we'll see those figures increase but you, I'll monitor that and happy to have a, a private conversation with you about it because I think we just need to keep that message going out that it is available and certainly we don't turn down waivers uh, for those who are eligible. Thank you, Paul. I'm more than welcome to meet with you, as you know, um, and I appreciate your answer and um, thank you. And that's me, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. I'm Paul. Thank you, Chair. Just on that point, because that was a very useful exchange, very informative exchange. Uh, so thank you for for being so open and transparent on that. But just on that point, so if 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 someone doesn't apply for the waiver, but you enact it, is that deemed there? No, because that's within my discretion. Right. Okay. okay. Um, uh, likewise, it would also be true that it wouldn't be deemed an error if I didn't act that way, because you know it, it's a matter of discretion. Yeah. Because the, the legislation, uh, I haven't got it in front of me, and Rachel probably has, but uh, the legislation doesn't require me to do it. It says I may do it, but our standard approach is we will do it if, if it's engaged. Uh, so that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be an error. And, and another illustration of that, Paul, would be for inquests uh, and their... You know, I, I, I dealt with an application. I can I can mention it because it's not before the courts and it's not uh, it's not something that's in the public domain. But an individual who qualified for legal aid with a significant contribution, but Article Two issues were engaged in the death of their loved one. This is not an historical uh, context at all. But we have we have a discretion to apply the waiver and I exercise that discretion. So you're trying to make sure that people can get access to justice yeah. where the legislation confers a discretion to enable that to happen. Yeah. And, and of course, the access to justice piece is, is very important to us all, I believe. Uh, so you need a system wrapped around that that's fit for purpose. And I, 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 I sort of have a certain sympathy for you guys grappling with a system that isn't fit for purpose in many ways. Uh, but we've got the the measurement on the of the quarters for the quarters one and four in two thousand and nine, and as you've rightly said, the estimate there is eleven point one percent of of error. Can I can I clarify something? Is that error and fraud, or is that just error? Okay, so that is error as it is currently uh, developed. Because it's official error at this point in time, 
unless there is an implication that a member of staff was paying something inappropriately, the issue of fraud is not a particularly live issue in it. That is not to say that over time, if there was a charging pattern which produced errors, that that charging pattern shouldn't be looked at. But that, that's a, a different extension of that. And my recollection from colleagues in England and Wales is you know, where there is a, a proven case of fraud, it will be treated outside yes. this fraud and error piece uh, as, as we refer to it. Yeah. So, so what we've got here is a snapshot, I feel like. Yes. Uh, now, I, I do note that there's, whilst that's 11.1% is an estimate, there are lower confidence level intervals and upper confidence yes. intervals. So I suppose a question that's obvious to me is, how confident are you that that 11.1% is a true reflection and it won't bounce up in a true fashion uh, in, in reality to 135 with regards to the upper confidence level? Uh, and of course, don't get me wrong, there's a positive to that too, where it could be down to 8.8 .8 for absolutely, lower confidence. Uh, absolutely. But, but that in itself is such a wide uh, margin of error, if, if you want. We're between What we're talking about in figures here, not percentages, is 6.5 million to 10 million. Yeah. You know, there's a, a big difference there. There's a big there. difference. Uh, so, how confident are you that the 11.1 is pretty close to a mark? At this point in time, I wish I worked for NISRA to be able to answer your question, Paul, because we're, we're getting deep into statistical uh, theory here. But as, as, you, as you've seen from the report, um, the estimate is based on a confidence level of 95%. So in my way of describing that, it means that every, nine, every uh, 19 times, every 20 times you run it, you should get that sort of answer 19 times, so it's highly stable. Uh, you've then got the, the confidence interval, you know, how accurate is that, and that's within plus or minus 3%. Now, over time, and I think this is the difficulty of this being the first full year of data, over time you'll see movement in that. I would like to think that the movement will always be downward, but I couldn't look you in the eye and say that there will not be a couple of cases some year which will move it in a different direction. That's just the nature of the beast. But I, th I think what we've got is a statistical model which is taking you know, over 800 cases of a sample. Those cases are stratified over all aspects of legal aid from advice and assistance, the representation or the civil courts and the criminal courts. And it charts the volume of transactions that go through that and it measures them by how much they they cost. It's a very sophisticated uh, table. Uh, I probably got a sore head trying to prepare for this question uh, than all of them because it's actually a methodology which is developed by NISRA. It sort of reflects the methodology that's been in place for years in benefits yeah. and it's been, a, it's been adapted to the legal aid environment. So I think the methodology is accredited and is sound, what we've got to do is be consistent in how we do things, and then we will see the benefit of that. With regards to the snapshot of the one year, uh, how, how do you feel about f previous years? And, and uh, I'm asking you to give a, and the, you know, it's just probably a feeling in your bones more than any, than any statistics, but do you feel that the example year of 2019 would be would be an exemplar of other years. So what I'm saying is, do you think that 11.1 estimate is consistent, G given what you've just said about cases and complex cases and and different weights and 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 uh, business within courts, uh, which I'm sure is fluid up and down. Yeah. But even if it is fluid up and down with regards to work rate, if there's still that 11 percent or 10 percent. Uh, error rate, margin of error, then uh, what I'm asking is, do you think is that a consistent error rate? Do you think ha has it got worse over the years to the point where you've, we've had this uh, this uh, investigation? Well, uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, what I would say, uh, Paul, is this. 
because the remuneration has changed you know, almost every year uh, for different reasons, I don't think you could assume that it was the same. Uh, you know, if I go back to 2008 in Magistrates Court, the basis of, chase of calculating fees, I think, would probably have given an extremely low error rate because it was discretionary by an external panel. So I don't think you would have really had an error rate there. It's only when you bring everything into that melting pot, you put a statutory structure around it, and then you start measuring it. And over time, we'll have changes of staff. And with changes of staff, that, that brings in a new phase of the cycle. Yes. That those people need to be trained again, need to be developed again. And that's your work that Mandy's doing extensively at the minute. And we're actually in the process of getting some trainers. Uh, for those that used to have an interest in DFC, they may be coming from DFC. So you know, we think people with a legislative training background is really going to add value to the organisation and to our staff development and training. So I think over time it will fluctuate, but if you're saying to me, as I suspect you are, has it always been like that? I would say it's probably changed every year. Can, can I ask about the fraud team? Yeah. Uh, is that set up yet, that operational? <laughs> yes, we, we, have a, we have a fraud team in place. There's currently nine people there. Four of them are qualified. Um, as you know from previous exchanges, the, the difficulty that the fraud team have traditionally uh, had is that they are reactive. They're usually reactive to the opponent of somebody who's got legal aid complaining that they shouldn't have got legal aid. Now, as we all know, there's an importance to dealing with whistleblowing. Uh, there may be substance in that. Uh, and one of the things maybe I should say is that when someone's on a passported benefit, the legislation requires me to accept that as a fact. I can't look behind it. So, you know, and, and universal credit is an interesting phenomenon in that respect because the range of payment on universal credit can be so significant. So there is an aspect there that people come and bring things which there may not be any substance to. In other cases, there may be. And for example, in, in the financial year that's passed, I think we referred seven cases to the police. They all happened to be applicants, and there were various issues about non-disclosure of material. So we've got four qualified uh, uh, colleagues working there. Our intention is actually to grow that as we start to do practitioner fraud in there and try to get away from the predominantly reactive yeah. work into proactive work. That, that was my next question. So that fraud team at the minute, uh, I'd be interested to know what varies it has, but also what who is it actually investigating? Is it the applicant, the practitioner, or your staff members? So the, the vast majority of the work that gets referred to the counter fraud unit is to do with applicants and whether they are truly financially eligible or not. They will also look at practitioner where there's any cases referred to them. And as you know, we have had uh, four... Uh, suppliers that have been referred to the police and all of those sorts of things. So they will look at that uh, and deal with that. We have, thankfully, uh, no issues that have been reported or no concerns that are before us in respect of any member of staff. And obviously there's an importance of declarations and conflicts of interest in terms of whose application you're looking at or whose payment you're processing. So I think what we're trying to get to is into the space where that team works with Mandy's team that are looking at the actual files that are coming in and then are going off and doing, well, is there a pattern there? Is there a type of case that we should look at? Is there a type of application we should look at to see if there's a pattern of behaviour? And that could float its way back, not in any fraud sense, but it could float its way back to the department saying, well, that fee needs to be looked at and how people can claim that fee needs to be revisited. So there, there's a bit of a cycle here which actually might give benefits which isn't about a fraud prosecution, yeah. but it may be to tighten up the system. Okay, listen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your your refreshing stance and the way you're as, asking answering questions. It's been very, very good. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and, and thank you, Paul. And, and, and just to say what Paul threw, uh, it's absolutely correct. I think you, your, your answering of the questions has been uh, really good. Um, 
Uh, and, and I just want to ask a question. I'm going to apologise, Paul, for asking this question because I think I should know this. Um, uh, and it's in the back of my mind, and I don't know why. But did I read somewhere, is there, is there a proposal, is there a review somewhere that law firms in receipt of legal aid will once again have those accounts published with how much legal aid they're getting in a yearly basis um, to each firm and what level they're getting it out? Is, is that... Did, did I have I dreamt that, or was that actually happening? I, I'm sure it's in your consultation papers you're about to read, Doug, uh, because uh, it went out in April, and uh, uh, sorry, it went it went out a, a couple of months ago, and it's due in at the start of April. So there's uh, a proposal to re-establish the approach, but it sets out a, a range of ways in which information could be published. So, yes, that will be part of the agenda, and obviously I'm very interested in the responses we'll get to that consultation. So that was a, a very easy question, and Paul, I do apologise for no. it. And, and that, that's probably where I, where, I, where I read it. I just think it was coming up somewhere. Um, you know, um, but listen, thank you for that. I'll not, I'll not keep you any further. I think you, your answer has been really good. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, um, Paul and Mandy. And to be fair, um, my point has been mainly gone over, but I suppose I do have one just lingering question. Mandy, you mentioned the error in um, the documentation about whether the practitioner was submitting a bill based on our, our item and also the error around mileage. And I'm just wondering if they're inbuilt in these statistics and have been ironed out, or are you hopeful that that has been sorted? Is it likely? I'm just trying to work how significant was that? Have you costed what those errors represent in these numbers? And therefore, then, will we see an absence of them in any future figures coming forward? And I still don't, I'm not fully clear on just how forensically this happens in terms of a practitioner who perhaps habitually has errors. Is there a red flag warning system in this that does alert then, and I appreciate what you're saying about the, the fraud piece being almost external to this, but is there an inbuilt mechanism in this measuring system that would help point to any offences that just appear to be habitual? Thank you. Okay, Sinead, um, if I could take you to Table 7 in the Official Air Report, and what that does is it gives you the category of air and the main areas of air, and obviously the issues that I was describing in relation to the per item uh, per hour was an issue around um, the second category, the amendment uh, required to the remuneration order, and that has now been fixed. So, absolutely, I would expect that I don't see, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, as many errors on that issue as we might have seen in previous times. Um, the other areas um, we have civil tax cases; they are no longer included in the sample because we had received legal advice. Um, to say that um, we do not have any uh, control over that judicial function and therefore we can't go behind the payment decision in that. So th those cases are now removed from the sample. So you won't see any cases in there in the future. Um, the other areas really are assessor error and that is really mainly around um, not paying everything that the person should have been entitled to. So going back to the point that, you know, you only claim this, so that's all you're getting, instead of you should have been entitled and this is now what we're going to pay. So we have new procedures in place where the staff actually now would flag the dates to the practitioner, where they would actually, the, the practitioner know that as far as we can see, you were at court on X, Y, and Z. You only claimed X. If you now want to make a claim, you need to submit a payment request for Y and Z, and we will then process. So that's all part of our procedural work in terms of um, picking up on those issues. In terms of then your second question um, in regard to SAU measurement, 
Absolutely, we will look at those findings. And what we do is then we look at the sort of individual solicitors and barristers, um, sort of where there might be instances of recurring patterns. In the main, that is to try and assist the practitioner to actually help us to address those common errors. So that's where we've done a lot of guidance and messaging and support um, to practitioners to try and help them help us because if they get it right, then we get it right. Um, the other issue is as well is um, in November and December up until the middle of January this year, I introduced 100% checking on every single payment request at every single level of service that came into the agency. So every payment before it was released was 100% checked and that was to actually help me understand the errors, the reason for the errors happening and also then to look at what support and training my staff would require to help them to improve things and as Paul has also referred to, to actually help us look at maybe some areas of the legislation where our staff are interpreting it incorrectly, where we need to go and get an opinion from the department to get an agreed position. Um, so all of those matters have been being progressed. The 100% checking then drove out individual checking percentages for every single member of staff who payment processes. And that is um, reviewed on a weekly basis with the line management and is either increased or decreased or stand still. Um, I did have a staff member remind me as I went out the door today to make sure and say that there were some people who had zero error rates. And that is true, and, but it can depend on the type of case. And as Paul has referred to, you know, the legislation in the Crown Court rules, if you start in 2015, maybe you should have started in the rules in 2019. And one week you could have no errors and the next week you could have a number depending on the case type you're dealing with. So uh, really to give you assurance, we are really, you know, monitoring, looking at repeat patterns. We do have a system where we look for duplicate claims. Um, and basically what we would do is look for certificates and we use the ICOS record um, through the courts. Uh, Standard Assessment Unit also um, introduced 100% checking on all ICOS records and they shared with me all the checks they do and I actually replicated those to my staff. So in every single case as well, we do 100% ICOS checks. So that's the sort of programme of work that we have been um, embedding and obviously, once we get our trainers in, which we're hoping will be after Easter, um, they will very much focus on training the staff and legislation and actually making sure that um, the errors that we are picking up are actually worked through in terms of helping staff to improve their accuracy. But the staff are very much on board with this. Um, I think it's one of the most talked about subjects, to be honest with you, um, and it is encouraging that um, I really think we're now getting to grips and understand what we need to do. And Jeanette, if I, if I could just add one observation to that, just to give uh, a reflection on is there a pattern? Sometimes there's a pattern because there has to be a pattern. So a solicitor might be asserting that in these sets of circumstances they're entitled to fee A, we might say, no, you're not, you're entitled to fee B. They will then ask for an internal review of that case. We may still uphold our position that it's fee B, and they may then go on appeal to the taxi master. Now, each case that they have that is of that type, they will have to apply for the fee which they believe they should be entitled to, because they're keeping their doorway open so that if the taxi master decides on appeal that they were right, that you, that follows through. So I, I, I'm always just th this little bit anxious that there can't be a degree of pattern that a practitioner has to follow to assert the right, and that may only be established on appeal, but you know, there's a difference there between, I think, what Paul was saying about a pattern and this, which is, if you like, a required pattern, which is actually driven by the legislation itself, if that makes sense. Thank you. Paul. Oh, yes, I think that's certainly worthy of note. Um, thanks, Mandy. That was very thorough, um, a very thorough answer. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Linda Dillon. 
Chair, I have three questions and they have all been answered and, oh. and I had all the questions as well, but they were they were answered in, in the brief that was that was done at the beginning by um Andrew. So thank you. It was it was a very detailed brief to start with and then I've got the answers to the other questions through the, the responses. So thank you. And thank you for do, for the presentation to both of you. Okay, well, then I don't have anybody else at this stage indicating. So, can I ask a wee question? Yes, Paul, uh, go ahead. Can I ask, is the, is the time delay still a massive issue whereby practitioners wait for a period of time before they put in or submit uh, for payment? Um, um, is that still an issue and does that affect errors? It, it, can, it can make things difficult because the longer that that case has been running, if we, through Mandy's uh, a team, raise a query, that could be going back several years, as you know, just for the normal life of a case. So, and then the, the accuracy of that can be a problem. I think what I would say, Paul, is this, that when it comes to the regular magistrates court, crown court cases, when it comes to the, the family cases in the FPC and in the county court, we're getting them in. I, I can tell you now that our level of intake of bills uh, in criminal cases is almost pre-COVID levels. Now, in a sense, you know, there's been a catch-up with the courts, as, as you appreciate, sure, mm -hmm. but you, they are flying in, and we haven't, we haven't stopped to do an analysis of is the end of case to submission of payment time getting shorter? I suspect for cash flow reasons it is. I think where it becomes a problem is in bigger civil cases where they're maybe going to taxation. The problem isn't with the delay at the taxi master stage, nor when it comes to us, but to get it to the taxi master can create uh, you know, a, a period of time, some better than others. But that's the only niche, Paul, that I would say, that that's, in, in a sense, that's beyond our control. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, can I thank both of you for, for coming and taking the time of the committee? So it's, it's very much appreciated. No we, will, we will ask for, uh, I know the Business Consultancy Services final report will come out and, and obviously we'll, we will want to see that in due course. So we, we'll just send it to you, Chair, once it becomes available. That would be great. And then I know you had indicated about providing us with some more regular yeah. updates and, and we're happy to take that in writing in terms of a written paper. That's so fine. As, they, as they are available... We'd be keen to see them as well, so thank you. Fine. Okay, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Not at all, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the committee. Okay, members, well, then we, we'll um, obviously just formalise that request in terms of the business um, consultancy service report and then just getting regular updates as well. Then, if members are content, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, the draft modern slavery, uh, slavery strategy 2021-22. And again, we've got officials attending the media uh, the meeting via the Starleaf facility on this occasion, and they're going to outline the results of the consultation on this strategy and proposed next steps. So the committee had previously considered a consultation on the draft strategy, and would consider that further when the results of the consultation were available. So at pages 129 to 235 of the meeting pack, and hopefully at this stage, we're able to bring in officials from the department, um, and I am uh, in a position to see them, I, I hope, on this occasion. If we can just check that. Seem to be okay. okay, that's great. Yes, we can see you, so thank you. Thank you for that. So can I just formally welcome uh, Cathy Galway, Deputy Director of Protection Organised Crime Division, and Sinead Simpson, Head of the Organised Crime Branch within the Department. And again, we'll just record this by Hansard, and a transcript will then be published. So I'm happy to, to hand over to yourselves to provide an outline, and then we'll move into some questions. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear us okay? Yeah. We, we can, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're really grateful for the opportunity to update the committee on the outcome of the consultation on the draft modern slavery strategy for 21-22. Um, as you will see from the briefing note, the consultation on the draft strategy closed on the 7th of January this year. The analysis of the responses is complete and the response summary document is being prepared. Um, 
Just by way of context, um, Section 12 of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Criminal Justice and Support Victims Act 2015 requires the Department to publish an annual modern slavery strategy. And this draft is the fourth um, iteration of that and it's published in accordance with, with Section 12. The 2021 strategy has been developed and informed through engagement with key partners across government law enforcement and civil society who are committed to working together to tackle modern slavery. Uh, members of the Organised Crime Task Force and the Modern Slavery Subgroup and the Modern Slavery NGO Engagement Group have also played a critical role in helping to shape it. Um, it has been informed by recent commentary and recommendations from Dame Sarah Thornton, the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner, in her recent annual report and the findings from the recent Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland Inspection Report on Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking. So the purpose of the annual strategy as set out in the legislation is to raise awareness of modern slavery offences and contribute to a reduction in the number of such offences. The aim is to equip Northern Ireland to eradicate modern slavery and while that seems like a very straightforward aim, obviously, and I'm, I'm sure you've read from the responses to the consultation, delivering on that aim is actually a lot more complicated and, and complex and we hope to, to take through some of those issues as we um, go through the session today. So this annual strategy groups ongoing strands of activity in line with legislative requirements, including raising awareness of the rights and entitlements of victims of modern slavery and human trafficking offences, training for those involved in investigating or prosecuting relevant offences or working with victims of such offences, and cooperation between relevant partner agencies in dealing with relevant offences or the victims of such offences. So it's really around raising awareness um, training, cooperation and prosecuting and fundamentally it is about support for victims. The strategic and legislative frameworks are intended to help reduce the threat from, the vulnerability to and the prevalence of modern slavery in Northern Ireland. It builds on a significant body of work to tackle modern slavery that has already been delivered through previous strategies and implemented in partnership with key stakeholders. It also builds on the strategic commitments by continuing in, that was outlined in 1920, by continuing um, with the shared strategic outcomes, objectives and activities through to 21-22. And they are focused on pursuing and disrupting offenders. Um, and that's by enhancing the operational law enforcement response and bringing offenders to justice, protecting the needs of victims by improved victim identification and support. And as I said, putting them at the center of all our efforts and preventing modern, modern slavery by engaging partners across key services, business, non-governmental organisations and the wider public in reducing vulnerability and demand. Uh, under each of the three strands, there are a range of objectives and commitments, and I think we've got about 32 in all at the moment, and these will be taken forward through a collaborative approach with partners, law enforcement agencies, frontline professionals and practitioners, and as well through the general public in terms of the raising awareness. These commitments will continue to guide the work of partners engaged in tackling modern slavery and um, the, we, this is a proportionate um, refresh of the, of the strategy going in for one year. Um, in light of the plans to move away from the legislative requirement from, for an annual strategy to a three-year strategy, this will enable us to take a longer term approach and, and so this, I just want to say this one is a, a, a proportionate refresh. We, we do hope to go into a longer term strategy after this year. So in terms of the outcome of the consultation, just very quickly, don't want to go through everything because uh, you know an overview of the main findings and the responses is included in the paper provided for today's session. But as you will see from that paper, we received 26 responses to the formal consultation and we would like to acknowledge the useful, detailed and informative quality of all of those responses. As you can see, taken on a strictly numerical count, the responses are overwhelmingly positive. A further analysis shows that generally respondents supported the strategic aim, priorities, objectives and measures. Respondents welcomed the alignment with the organised crime strategy and the direct linkages to wider government objectives and local community plans. They welcomed the three priority pillars of pursue, protect and prevent, with some highlighting that they should each receive appropriate focus. A number of respondents highlighted the importance of partnership working and creating greater capacity, both across the sector and with the public, 
to be aware of and recognise the signs of trafficking and exploitation. While the level of overall agreement is really encouraging, um, respondents also made a number of helpful suggestions, including calls for us to address, provide more detail on, or to give more prominence to particular issues such as the lack of visibility of child victims throughout the strategy and uh, asking for additional measures and suggesting how um, some of that lack of visibility could be addressed. Um, the interface between reserved immigration asylum issues and devolved modern slavery and human trafficking policy. The need for sufficient recognition of the impact that EU exit could have on modern slavery and human trafficking and more detail on post-EU exit arrangements. Um, the need for adequate resources, the need for a whole system approach with synergies across various strategies and the work of other government departments, and uh, critically the role that local government and NGOs and wider civic society can play in tackling this issue. Um, improvements to data collection and research and measurement of outcomes and further consideration of how to secure effective uh, victim and survivor, including child victims, uh, participation in the policy development and evaluation processes. And the need for proactive and holistic communications which address and highlight child specific issues. So the briefing paper obviously sets this out in more detail um, and in terms of updating the strategy then um, we have received some very comprehensive responses and um, some of which have raised quite complex issues and they will need to be considered in more detail. We accept the broad thrust of many of the suggestions and will work with our statutory and NGO partners to consider them further as we develop this strategy and the longer term strategy going into 22-25, hopefully. Um, we've set out for the committee those issues that we consider would benefit from further engagement and consideration in the longer term. Uh, for the purposes of the 21-22 strategy and updating that, we're proposing that um, we take account of the responses received to the consultation and the proposed changes as outlined in the paper to the committee. Um, uh, and as we consulted on this towards the end of 2020, um, we, do, we do want to update it in terms of EU exit and the post-EU exit arrangements. Um, the need to be clear about the scope of the strategy in terms of what's devolved and non-devolved. Um, we also want to make clearer linkages um, and highlight the opportunities to develop and, and to enhance how we raise awareness of human trafficking and slavery-like offences, support victims and bring offenders to justice. So, Chair, I hope I've provided a bit of an overview on the um, draft strategy and the outcome of the consultation and how we propose subject to the views of the committee to reflect these in finalising the 21-22 uh, strategy for publication. Um, while also committing to a process of engagement on the detail of other long term, longer term considerations. So thank you. We'll, we'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. OK, thank you. And that, that has been very helpful and obviously appreciate the amount of work um, that um, you will have put into this and your team around it. Um, and it's a very important document um, because obviously it's the actions that flow from the strategy. So we need to get that that right um, to make sure the downstream effect does what we hope it uh, does do and, and we all want that. I, I suppose just a, a couple of points. I know that there were some of the respondents that didn't agree. I appreciate the majority did, but some didn't um, agree around the draft uh, strategic priorities on pursue, protect and prevent. Um, do you want to just comment on, on how you you have taken those points on board um, and in terms of now reflecting that in the document? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll um, do a bit of an intro on that and then Sinead will come in. Um, in terms of uh, any of the responses that didn't completely agree with them, um, so broadly speaking they did agree but they did want to see um, more detail in some of them and um, also wanted to see more explicit references to children and children's issues. Um, so we do intend to reflect on that. Um, some, For example, some people thought that just by calling it a modern slavery strategy, even though at the start we explained that it also includes human trafficking, many people thought that because the title human trafficking wasn't in it, that it actually 
probably didn't resonate in the same way and and so for things like that you know absolutely taking that on board in terms of how we reflect on um issues around you know what we're going to do to raise awareness and how we're going to engage with local councils and, and you know other uh, ngos and partners taking all of that on board i think some of the issues in terms of what people wanted to see will need a longer term um, response and consideration and we actually do need to engage with those stakeholders as, as we go forward because we only have one we have this strategy for one year so we can reflect on the things that are you know able, we are able to achieve in one year but some of the things will take longer and especially if there's a legislative change so for example the duty to protect or you know section 22 that sort of thing that will take longer and we want to engage with stakeholders as we do that so we're very um we accept uh, you know mostly everything that people have said there's nothing that we would argue with in terms of what the strategy needs to do i think for us it's about what we can realistically achieve in a year and some of the things that we would like to bring into a longer term approach yeah so in, in terms just to um, supplement what kathy said in terms of some of the changes that we plan to make in the 21 22 strategy as Cathy has said, um, there are some helpful suggestions about the the, the, brand, the, the the title of the strategy. So we're happy to consider, I mean, obviously we want the strategy to have the most possible reach into the community. So we're happy to look at the at the language that choose to, to broaden it out from modern slavery into human trafficking. Um, uh, some consultees also said that whilst it was implicit throughout the strategy that the identification of victims was an important strand of work, uh, that that wasn't um, the words identification did not feature in the strategic aim, and um, so we we plan to address that. Um, there were also suggestions that we could, in our context section of the strategy, we could explain a little bit more about um, the the particular groups in society who are particularly at risk um, to modern slavery and human trafficking. So we can make those uh, changes. Um, in terms of the, the comments that were made around Pursue, there were um, comments about um, the interface of the, the appropriate linkage between the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit within the Police and Public Protection Branch, and those are linkages that do exist. Um, so we have um, we will work now with our PSNI colleagues to, to, draw, that, to draw that out a little bit more. Um, we also had some comments about the need for uh, training for certain categories of first responders and the need for data. Um, all of those are um, in the strategy, but I think given that, that folk had looked at the strategy and came back with those comments, I think we need to look at how we, how we present those. And I think that is something that will feed into our longer term piece of work as well. We need to think about how, um, how accessible the document is and the communications strategy that we need to, to go along with it. Um, the uh, other changes that we can easily make um, under the protect strand, there were suggestions that victims should be signposted to victim information schemes. That's not something that we probably need to make a change to the strategy per se, uh, but we can absolutely through our NGO group uh, make that happen. Um, there's also a suggestion that in terms of the list of first responders in Northern Ireland, that local authorities should be added to the list. And that's actually a strand of work that we we have started on. Um, there is work that's needed to to educate and, and guide and, and train before um, before categories of staff would be added to the list of first responders. And, and we've already started down that road with guidance for councils um, issuing last year, um, and with further work planned this year in terms of a, a, a training plan. And um, there, as Cathy mentioned, there was a lot of uh, commentary about the visibility of, of child victims or the lack of visibility of child victims in the strategy. Um, and I think we haven't spoken with health colleagues. I think there is a lot more that we could say about what um, about the supports and arrangements that are in place for child victims. Um, so there's there's um, a number of comments that we can take on board mm -hmm. about safe accommodation, their access to mental health services, um, and then more generally. Um, it wasn't obvious to consultees that that the um, the support services that are provided that they actually comply with um, national trafficking survivor care standards. So mm -hmm. I think there was a lot in the space of um, things that that are already being done, but it just needs drawn out better for for um, for people mm -hmm. reading the strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so suppose we want to we want to um, enhance that and ensure that the things that are all, that are already in place and the frameworks and legislative frameworks and everything that operates, particularly for children, you know, that we reflect that appropriately. I think 
because it wasn't explicitly referenced i think some people maybe thought that it in some cases that it wasn't happening but it is happening but obviously there's still more that needs to be done you know and and working with our stakeholders we want to take that forward and agree what that is you know and that whatever is is going into a revised strategy actually is deliverable and you know is in line with the best practice and and every everyone has highlighted throughout the consultation I mean some of their responses were really comprehensive and have you know given us a lot to think about um, and there, there isn't anything in it that we would say well you know that's not relevant apart from I think some of the issues around asylum seeking children where we actually don't have the policy remit to change some of that but it's still important that we link you know we understand what the implications of you know asylum um policy immigration policy is and what impact that will have on um victims and survivors of uh, human trafficking okay thank you i'm gonna bring other members just in at this stage so if i can start with linda Dillon, and then i know um doug and Sinead have had their hands raised from the last one and that may be applicable to this session as well and if it is that's fine keep it on um but i'll bring linda Dillon in at this stage Thank you, Chair. And it's actually just my, my first point is a follow on from the point just talked about, and that's in relation to the immigration. And I accept that it's um, outside of the remit of DOJ. However, I think that we as a committee and as an assembly, actually, and we did have a, a debate in relation to this issue, I think it was in October um, 2020, and we supported the motion to allow those victims to, to have leave to remain for 12 months. My own view and the view of my party is 12 months is not the right um, approach, that it should be unlimited for a number of reasons. And, and as I say, I'm outlining this whilst I accept that it's out, outside of the departments, but I think the points need to be made because we need to try and see what we can do to address this as an assembly. And it may well not be a devolved matter, but I don't accept that that is you know that we just accept that and we say well it's not devolved and we're gonna we're not going to worry about these victims because we are our own assembly and we should be looking after these people and we're potentially sending victims back to places where they will not be accepted for the very reason that they are a victim of of being trafficked for sex so they won't be accepted in very many circumstances maybe back into their own communities and we're sending them back to that and i just think that situation is unacceptable we have victims, as we, as we learned through the course of the domestic abuse bill, who have no recourse to public funds, so they're therefore no recourse to housing, no recourse to any type of help or assistance. And for me, that is just an unacceptable situation and circumstance. And I do think, as an assembly chair, we have to look at this and address it. But it isn't, in fairness, something as for the department to necessarily, as I suppose, can't address on their own. But I would ask that they do look at what potential is there for us to address this and, and speak to their other executive colleagues, bring it to the executive table. What can we do as a devolved assembly to address this issue? Because for me, it, it, it's unacceptable that we just say we can't deal with it, you know, so we let it go. I think that's the first thing. Can I just ask, Chair, that... Um, that we look at maybe getting an update on what is going to be done to address the the issues that have been highlighted in the consultation you know particularly and i think i appreciate the comments to be fair around the fact that the department wants to pick up on most of them particularly around that issue of you know the child victims not being visible um language is even this the stuff around you know modern slavery and, and trafficking language is so so important to victims and I mean, we, we've seen that through our, our work with l legacy victims, but also with victims of, of historical institutional abuse and, and mother and baby homes. Language is vital when you're talking to these people and about them. And to them, it means as much as what you're doing in terms of legislation very often. So I think we do need to, to ensure that we use the type of language. And the only way to do that is by engaging with the victim and survivor community. But if they're only here for 12 months, I think we're limited in, in how well we'll do that. Um, yeah. So I, I do think that, the, again, I'm going to go back to that point, it needs to be addressed. Um, as I say, I, I, would, I would appreciate a report around um, those particular issues, also around the Brexit and the, the potential impact 
around that. I mean, that has imp implications not just across countries for us. It has an implication for us in this very country in terms of the fact that we, we have two jurisdictions and, and, and a border. So we need to, to look at what the implications are going to be and how that's going to be addressed and by the department. So I would appreciate, I suppose, in short, <laughs> to be fair, it is um, just getting an update as soon as possible on what's going to be done to address those issues that have been highlighted through the consultation. And I think that is the points that I want to make for now, Chair. I, I, if I have to come back in, I'll, I'll indicate and let you know, but I, I, I think that's that's me for now. And I appreciate that the first points are out with your your responsibility, but I would like it brought back to the, the minister that I think we need to look at how she can address those issues with her executive colleagues. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Linda. And we'll we'll keep a note of those wider points. You know that the committee, and uh, we can action that at the end of this session once we, we've covered all the issues. But uh, yes, if um, folks want to just pick up on that on some of those points from the department. Yeah. Yeah. So. In terms of the issue about um, what we're going to do, how we're going to deal with the responses that we've had. So the, the uh, summary of the consultation responses that, that has been shared with the committee, you'll see under each section, we have um, uh, given some narrative on the specific comments that will now be incorporated in the 21-22 strategy and then those that will be taken on board in the longer term. So what our plan is for all of those that we've brigaded in the section, these will be taken on board as part of the development of the 21-22. Um, we will now seek to make those changes and uh, we will, we've got two uh, groups under the organised crime task force structures that we work with in developing our strategy. One is a statutory group of all the agencies who have a role in tackling modern slavery. So we will make the amendments that we have outlined in this paper that we're going to make. Um, and we will run that past our statutory partners and we'll also share it with our NGO group um, and check that everyone's happy. We will, um, I mean, we would like to be able to publish the 21-22 as close as possible to the end of March, early April as, um, as we can. Um, and we will, um, as we would do with all our strategies, we, we can share that with uh, committee members. In terms then of the, the, the longer term piece of work, and I suppose for us a big issue was, as Cathy has said, we got very comprehensive responses, including from some of the, the NGOs who are represented on our, our group. Um, and and a, a big issue that resonated with us um, was the need for that participation by people in the policy development process, including the participation of child victims. So even if it were physically possible from a resource point of view, which, which it isn't, to take on board all these issues within the next three weeks and, and get a strategy out, I think for us it feels right. You know, we've had the legislation now five years. We've had uh, four annual strategies. Hopefully, we will get the legislative change to be able to move to a three-year. And it feels right that over and above delivering the commitments in the 21-22 strategy over the next 12 months, that a significant chunk of our time and energy will now go into working with partners on the NGO group and those who have, who aren't on the group who gave us consultation views um, to start to develop. You know, how how might we? Uh, make the make the strategy uh, more accessible. How might we put the, the um, make sure that the um, the child victims are at the heart of it? Make sure that we reflect all the conventions that we need to reflect. Uh, look at our uh, communication strategy. Look at how we engage. Um, look at how we give. Uh, victims, including child victims, our role in that process over the next year. So there's quite a considerable amount of work to be done. But in, in the short term, over the next number of weeks, there, there's some drafting changes that we can make that we'll share with those partners, as I've outlined, and we can give the, the committee members a copy when that's going out for consultation. And then we can we can quickly move into a phase of, of getting some workshop sessions set up with, with NGOs and others to start to tease out how we do this in the longer term. And in terms of the immigration issue, I mean, why immigration policy isn't involved, it doesn't mean that we aren't aware of the impact of that on, on, on people who are going through that process or who arrive in the country, and particularly with, you know, unaccompanied separated children, you know, so it's not that we're saying that's something separate over here, because, you know, it, you know, as as we would hear from our colleagues and our practitioners, you know, um, the fact that they've arrived here, they may have been victims of trafficking, exploitation on that route. You know, they, you know, all sorts of things could have happened to them, um, during that journey. You know, and we are, you know, 
I think what would maybe be helpful then if we come back with where we see that going forward in terms of the impact of that and in terms of reflecting on the needs of victims and survivors and ensuring that all of those experiences are reflected in this strategy. I suppose we're just trying to be clear where, where people were raising issues around immigration policy at the moment. It's not something we could fix you know, through, through a modern slavery strategy, but we're absolutely alive to the needs of victims and survivors in, in whatever way, you know, that they've arrived, and particularly um, on a company and separated children. And, and in terms of the point then about uh, Brexit, I mean, obviously we drafted this strategy and, and put it out for consultation in early October, so that was in advance of knowing what the, the final agreement would be. So we do intend to put in a couple of paragraphs in the in the strategy um, to reflect the, the, the um, the implications of the, you know, uh, tackling modern slavery in a, in a post-Brexit era. I suppose um, those who don't have the actual form of words here, the um, uh, in, information from our operational colleagues would suggest that, you know, whilst continued abuse of the common travel area has always been an issue, it will continue to be an issue. Um, as with um, uh, other organised crime types, we're not detecting any immediate diversification in, in, in activity. Uh, it is something, though, that the Organised Crime Task Force will keep under review, um, and also the, the modern slavery folk, who, who, the, the leads on modern slavery within PSNI, um, have recently commissioned a strategic assessment of modern slavery um, to give a better sense of the um, of the of the, the trends and the, and the patterns, and that will obviously also take into account any um, any changes that we see as a result of, of Brexit. So I think we need to put some narrative into the strategy to reflect the the outcome of the, the trade and cooperation agreement as we now know it. Um, but I think we also need to be clear that we're not seeing that we're not seeing a massive change, but that we also it is also something we need to keep under review. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Chair. Thank you for that, Linda. Um, is Sinead Bradley and then Rachel Woods. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. And to be fair, um, I think we've gone over it. I do have concerns. You know, these are very vulnerable people, and particularly if there are children associated um, with either the victim or they are actually victims themselves. And I suppose um, I, I have to welcome that at least that has bubbled up through the, the consultation and does seem to have a, a large focus going forward. But um, Linda's right, you know, we live on a on a landmass that um, whilst great efforts could be made to step in and assist these people and these victims, um, there could be an overnight flood, you know, and I want to know what sort of information sharing can happen in terms of um, a victim just being moved off, you know, across the border, and then perhaps a real breakdown in even finding out where that person is or where that child is. That's not something I think any of us could tolerate, and we 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 need to know that not just a strategy, but that the strategy highlights the need for robust process to be in place. Um, and and I want to just know how much teeth in terms of pulling together then, um, whatever policy or process is required to get to the, the nub of that potential problem. Uh, do you feel the strategy is a place that can point to that or accommodate that that piece of work? So, so do you mean in terms, so just to clarify, do you mean in terms of um, people who have been trafficked um, or uh, asylum seekers, so all, all victims and survivors, everyone who presents, so for anyone who's presenting as an asylum seeker or refugee status or whatever, because there there are processes that they go through. Yes, yes, appreciate there are there are people who are known to us and we know where they are and the, and they're in part of a process and they're probably less vulnerable. But it's those people who maybe are not, you know, that are here and we've identified and um, that there may be a linkage to a child as well. And I'm not I'm not taken from the, the vulnerability of the victim themselves, but they could be a child or have children with them. And I just want to know that the focus rightly um, is on children in this piece going forward. But I want to know, have we really robustly tried to safeguard as best we can, not just in this policy, but to make sure this policy is known to those who have a duty to enact and safeguard those children? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I suppose a 
couple of points there, I suppose it highlights um, in terms of what we can do through this strategy, accepting that immigration is not a is not a devolved issue. I think what we can do is make sure that um, a significant amount of energy is put into making sure that people are aware of the um, are aware of the national referral mechanism process because once people go into that process there are support arrangements that then kick in for both for adults and for children indeed when when, when children come into that process whether or not it's a child who has been identified as has been a potentially human trafficking victim or a child who is with a, a an adult who has been identified as a human trafficking victim, they will then come under the children's order like all separated and unaccompanied children and that they are entitled to all of the supports that you would expect for indigenous mm -hmm. children you know in terms of education mental health health accommodation financial support right up to the age of 21 or, or 24 if they're if they're in education mm -hmm. so I, I mean i suppose what we can do through this strategy is for for those folk who are perhaps in the in the asylum we, we we can't touch the asylum immigration process but if we raise awareness of the of the human trafficking system and the national referral system then we, we, at least we know that when people come into that system um that there are appropriate um safeguards and i mean you're probably taking us into territory which um it is the, the Health and Social Care um, Board in Northern Ireland that looks after the arrangements for, for child victims, but um, there, there are arrangements in place. There are special arrangements in place then over and above the normal arrangements that the children order would, would, would uh, bestow on them, um, such as the independent guardian service. So I think, I think it, it, and this is probably the conversation we need to have with NGOs over the next year, recognising and accepting you know, that, that it is a devolved issue. What 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 can we do within this space, and what more can what information do we need to get out there? Um, what you know, you, you know, how does it impact on our, our training, our raising, or you know, even the training that we and others would do for first responders? Do do we need to give a bit more context there to recognise that sometimes there's a fine line, particularly with children, there's a fine line between you know, are they actually you know, are they have they been part of an organised immigration, or 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 have they been trafficked? And, and a lot of folk would argue, well, if they're children. There's probably a trafficking element, regardless of whether they, they signed yeah. up to, to move to another country. So, um, so I think I think there's there is some stuff that we can do in that space of of raising awareness of the supports and the mechanisms that that are there and making sure that, that people avail of them. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. I think I think that highlights though that um, you know we we probably do need to do a lot more in terms of um, setting that out and in terms of you know there's a you know, a very um, particular focus on the national referral um, mechanism, but there are all sorts of statutory services that are in place and operating effectively um, for, you know, children in need under the children order for, you know, Sinead said the appointment of an independent guardian, which the Health and Social Care Board operate th through Bernardo's at, at the moment, you know, so um, we're, all of those arrangements are in place. You know, if they, if a child ends up, you know, if they, if the trust then takes that through to care proceedings, for example, um, then a guardian at Leiden would be appointed to um, represent the child in court. You know, there are pilots ongoing at the minute with um, is a children's law centre around. You know very particular legal advice and assistance um, for children. So there are things that are happening. And I think actually if we were to reflect that a bit more in the strategy, then people would maybe take a bit more comfort from the fact that all of those things are happening. That doesn't mean that we don't, don't still have a way to go in terms of you know, the, the duty to notify, in terms of you know other other things that we could do to improve. We, we wouldn't be complacent and you know the numbers are increasing all the time in, in terms of you know referrals to the NRM and why we are never sure whether that's an increase in prevalence or just an increase in raising awareness we have to be alert to it could be an increase in prevalence and so you know our colleagues in health would say that you know even the profile of children unaccompanied children has completely changed so a few years ago it would have been mostly females from Asian um, from Asia uh, Vietnamese now it's mostly East African um, young males who are unaccompanied so it, the situation is changing this is a really dynamic policy environment and there it is very very complex and so I think that you know for us to recognize that first of all and say you know while we don't have all the levers maybe in terms of devolved policy that doesn't mean that those um, that what's happening elsewhere isn't resulting in people you know being um, 
you know, potentially um, subjected to, you know, re-traumatization, potential for re-trafficking, for becoming destitute, homeless, you know, and that's, as, you know, as Linda, as you said, that's everyone's issue, you know, so we can't, we can't maybe fix everything in a modern slavery strategy, but we can work more effectively across government to ensure that we're all doing whatever we can in terms of the housing executive. I mean, they submitted a, a response which was, you know, the, um, really helpful in terms of what they could do, what they would notice, what they would be aware of in terms of rent and and, you know what district councils would be aware of and and some of those partners are actually more likely to see things happening on the ground you know and and it's it's just key that we reflect that and we work um together with them and that you know as we go forward we recognize all of these complexities and say well this isn't just a doj issue this is a health issue a police issue a local government issue a public issue you know the, the public can actually help as well so we've, we have a lot of work to do I think what we're saying is we recognise we have a lot of work to do. We want to engage with, with everyone who's um, responded and all our partners going forward. Some of it we will be able to um, you know, amend the 21-22 strategy, but actually a, an awful lot of it, because of the complexity, we do need to take that longer term approach. And so the change in the legislation and allowing us to go into a three year strategic framework with longer term commitments is actually going to help us to do that work. Because at the minute, we're, while it's really, really the, the, the legislation that, you know, the, the 2015 legislation was groundbreaking in terms of it led the way for other, you know, for English legislation, Scottish legislation, but an annual strategy actually, we're in the process of just constantly doing a strategy, whereas actually what we need to do is move towards the implementation and the working together with our stakeholders in the longer term. Thank you. And just one more um, point, Chair, if I could. In terms of then, I see mentioned throughout, um, you refer to resources and certainly when you're flagging up, you know, um, the traffic light system on different um, actions and that I see resource comes up again. Um, could you just give me an overview of that? You know, what are the resource issues? Okay, so I think from the consultation responses, um, you know, everyone welcomed, you know, the commitments and the actions, but also realised that, you know, some of this will need resources. And if we do have an increase in prevalence, which I think in terms of the independent guardian service and our health and social care colleagues would say, you know, they this is increasing. And all of this is happening within our universal services, you know, for looked after children where the numbers are increasing as well, you know, so there's pressure, I think, coming on a lot of areas in terms of, um, you know, responding to the issues that are highlighted in the strategy and what we know. So in terms of even our own um, contracts that we have through Migrant Help and uh, mm -hmm. Women's Aid, you know, the resources for that, you know, um, because there are more people who need support, then there, there's more demand. The, the, the key thing is that a lot of it is able to be delivered through universal you know, service provision, but some of it isn't, and it needs to the independent guardian and the uh, modern slavery and human trafficking unit in the PSNI. They have around is it 15, 16 okay. dedicated officers. We fund a dedicated training and data coordinator. Um, so it's a, um, a DOJ official, um, who works with the police so um there's there's pockets and different resources everywhere contributing to this you know it, it, it's not that we have a resource line for modern slavery and human trafficking mm -hmm. it's actually um like health and social care board they deliver this service within their um existing resources in terms of independent guardian um we deliver um the the support uh contract that's that's what we fund but over and above that, the, the department doesn't have a, a budget for modern slavery as such. Which I suppose is why, just to quickly add, and, and that's why we want to engage with our NGO partners and our statutory partners in, in over the next year to decide uh, the um, the prioritisation that's given to issues in the three-year strategy. We do want to, to capture everything, um, but we will need to have some conversations around you know what where would we what would we like to focus on in year one do we want to focus on providing extended support to victims so at the end of the nrm uh, where people have additional and ongoing needs and they're being picked up by organizations like flourish and, and others in the ngo sector do we want to move to put something like that on a, on a do we want to pilot it with a view to putting it on a statutory fitting or do we want to put our energies into 
um, slavery and trafficking risk orders, which which might well be a very good tool to have. But we know when looking at Scotland, it hasn't been used that often. So you know, we need to have those conversations about where okay, if everything can be done over the next three to five years, where, where do we want to put it? Because like all parts of government, you know. Choices have to be made on, on, on what gets a level of priority in the first instance. So um, I think that's another part of the resourcing conversation, just just how, how we sequence the work that needs done over the next three years. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Wedge. Thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of my questions have already been answered, so I'll not go over them, but um, just to touch upon with the resourcing issue, and you clarified there there's no actual central sort of resource budget from DOJ for this strategy, but is that um, something that would be considered going forward into a new three-year strategy? I, I, I'm not, I think like most things, um, this it's not necessarily one that requires more money for it uh, to happen. I think we've got a lot of statutory and unknown statutory partners uh, around the table. Um, I think um, some of the new chunks of work um, such as exploring um, slavery and trafficking risk orders, duty to notify, um, reviewing the Section 22 statutory defence, all those issues are issues that, that we as a team will be able to take forward in conjunction with our partners. I think when you get into issues such as extending the um, support for victims, that will obviously have an impact on the support contract and we need to look to see how we can find that money from within the, the department's budget, you know, if we do decide to, to go down that road. So, um, I think I think a lot of I think there's a lot of goodwill within the segment. We have a lot of NGOs around our, our um, engagement group table um, who go out and do uh, training for first responders and and do it you know at no additional cost. They're they they're, they're fund, they get funding streams from elsewhere and they're happy happy to do it. So for me, it feels more in the space of um, of harnessing. The resources that we have around that table, uh, making sure that the the police energies go in the right direction, making sure that the the, that the health energies and, and resources go in the right direction. Um, I, I don't yeah, know there's no, there's no doubt. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt though that if the so so the purpose of this strategy is to increase awareness to um, improve victim support. You know, so if if through increased awareness more victims, which is what we, you know, which is an, an outcome of the strategy, you know, to eradicate modern slavery, we are, we do have support contracts. We do have, um, a, you know, a, an in-house trainer in, in the PSNI that we fund. But as we move forward, if we are progressing with this strategy and if more people are known to the NRM and they go through the process and it's almost like a demand led service, you, you know, you won't be able to say, well, we'll invest X amount of million. Now you could say for research purposes, for bringing in the voice of young, you know, for bringing in the voice of survivors, for funding um, voluntary groups and whatever. We could look at what else could we do going forward in terms of, you know, um, how we utilise, for example, money that comes through assets recovery. Just for example, you know, and I know that our ARCS fund, we do fund a few of the, uh, you know, groups who would do modern slavery work. Um, so we do need to look at it. And if it, if if through the work that Sinead has said there, you know, more things come out that say, well, actually, if you want to improve that, you will need to invest in X or Y, then that's something that we could look at and be more informed about, I think, in a longer term um, strategy. At the minute, our funding is about the contract, about the trainer, and then the rest of the funding is in the police service, is in the health and social care board, is in the NGOs, you know, and we don't have a central pot of funding that goes out and funds activity or work or anything in the way that maybe you would see with other strategies, you know, um, we don't really have that, but it is something that you know, as as we go forward, it is something that we need to think about and look at. And that's what people have said to us in the consultation. Well, you know, some of this will need resourcing. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Certainly, um, there's going to be reviewing what can be done better and, and, and needs to be done. Then um, absolutely, we need to look at resourcing it properly. Um, but I suppose, as Linda and Sinead have already pointed out, there's a lot to be done that is not under the remit and, and the responsibility, but we do have a responsibility as as the assembly and as, as humans as well, you know, and just ethic responsibility um over over what happens to people and and in in our in our, our in Northern Ireland. Um and what but in just in terms of the relationship with the NIO and the uh, department's role with the Home Office, 
um, I noticed in the um, document it talked about a single competent authority. Could you give me a wee bit more information on what that is and what the department's role is within that? Okay, so so the, the single competent authority was established um, in I think uh, two thousand and nine. Um, so that's um, oh, sorry, a, a couple of years ago. It wasn't too, uh, just set up quite recently in the last three or four years. Um, the single competent authority comprised is a is a, a, a part of the Home Office. Previously, decisions around whether or not people were victims of, of human trafficking would have been taken by um, the, the NCA, um, the Home Office and, and a third body that's not springing to mind, but those three bodies were then brought together into the single competent authority. Um, that, that body receives um, a notifications or applications, if you like, from first responder organisations. So, for example, if, if PS and I were doing a, a, an intelligence led or a, a proactive um, investigation and they uncover what they believe to be victims of human trafficking, once they do their initial you know, victim safeguarding and, and protection issues, um, and before they would start their, 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 their formal investigation, um, they would make a referral, they would complete a first responder uh, form to the SCA. So that's a, an application outlining the reasons why they believe that someone is a, is a victim of human trafficking. So that goes to the single competent authority and then they make the decision on whether or not someone is a victim. We don't have any role whatsoever in, in that process. Agencies in Northern Ireland, um, such as PSNI, Border Force, Immigration Enforcement, Health and Social Care Trust, there's, a, there's about eight or nine organisations that are first responders. They make a, a submission to the SCA outlining the reasons why they believe someone is uh, a victim of human trafficking. The SCA then make that decision. They may well come back and they may well have, you know, require further information and there could be a two-way exchange then, but um, we don't have um, any uh, role in that. We do, I mean, obviously, um, tactic modern slavery, um, as with, I mean, Kathy and I also look after organised crime, as with other elements of organised crime, it's important that we are in tune with what's going on nationally. So, so we would have a lot of com contact with the Home Office. Um, it's important, particularly in relation to this issue, modern slavery, that there is a national approach taken to it. Um, so we would um, we would have regular um, dock-in meetings with the Home Office and indeed our other devolved administration colleagues. Uh, an issue that we're working on at the moment is transparency and supply chains. We have a consultation out. Um, that's very much in the space of trying to give effect in Northern Ireland to, to changes that are going to be made by the Home Office and, and Scotland are, are going to follow suit and hopefully get a consultation out in the next few weeks as well. So, so we do have a lot of contact with the Home Office. These, a lot of what we do is following national lead on issues, uh, but we do not have any role in the decision making process around yeah. NRM victims. But they, I mean, the government are trying to improve the system for um, settling cases more quickly and, and coming to decisions, um, you know, as promptly as possible. And you know, they are investing in in better decision making capacity, and they're on a big recruitment drive in terms of that single competent authority. So we should see, um, you know, improvements in terms of the length of time that it takes to um, get a, a conclusive decision. decision. Thank you very much. That was very detailed. Um, just never understood how that process works. Um, and I suppose just just on kind of local authorities and frontline um, sort of officers with regard to that, we talked about local authorities within the consultation and the strategy. Um, but who are we talking about here with regard to local authorities? Obviously, if it's a national approach, um, there's differences in the powers of local authorities between England, Scotland, Wales and ourselves. And obviously, it would be a local council here. Uh, we're talking about community planning, and we're talking about PCSPs, talking about environmental health officers, because it's not that much of a relationship as there would be uh, with the English councils, for example, um, as there is with with Northern Irish councils and the powers and the responsibilities that they hold. Yes. Go ahead. So, so, so for us, I mean, I, I'm not sure what exact part of the the strategy you're referring to, Rachel, when you talk about the reference to, to councils. But I know um, there, there's there's probably three areas. One, um, in terms of the we just made last year, we issued local we issued guidance to to, to local authorities, um, and that's that was developed in conjunction with with NILGA, um, and that was very much in the space of uh, for anyone any council staff who could potentially come across victims of 
human trafficking. Um, that was to raise their awareness of, of the signs of, of human trafficking and what to do. Um, we haven't yet moved to the point of adding specific local council staff to the list of first responders. There's still a bit more work to be done to make sure that that guidance is, is disseminated and that there's training to support it. Um, so that would be one uh, way in which we engage with councils. I think at a, at a local authority level, also the PCSPs have a role in terms of helping us to, to raise awareness. Um, the, the third area that the strategy references councils is in relation to um, transparency and supply chains. Um, as I've mentioned, we're, we're consulting on some changes. One of the changes is um, that the Home Office hope to make legislation later this year to um, bring public authorities under the transparency and supply chains arrangements. They, they currently only apply to commercial organisations. Um, so local authorities, if they have a, a budget of, a, a, of over 36 million, will um, be captured by that legislation if we also give effect to it here in Northern Ireland. Um, so there's also a role for us to engage, and it's something that, that we're hoping to do during the consultation period on the, the TISC arrangements. There's a role for us to engage with local councils, with the procurement people in the, in the councils. Um, so, so there's 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 a number of references in the strategy to to, to our engagement with with councils. Um, I mean, we appreciate that here council span, scope, powers, responsibilities slightly different across the water. So, whilst I say that this is some not modern slavery is something that we need a national approach to, and well, we obviously that's why we've got our own legislation, where we've got our own strategy. We need to we need to tweak and adjust to to make it fit the Northern Ireland situation, but not but not get out of step with what's happening nationally. I, think, I don't know, does yeah, that answer the question? I think we've used the terminology, local authorities, where we yeah. actually mean district Council. councils. Um, so, and I, I just find the reference to it there, yeah. So we're talking about, you know, making referrals through the national referral mechanism, which you was suggested in the consultation. And also, as Sinead said, you know, the NILGA, NISMP, and, and the Independent Anti Slavery Commissioner, you know, jointly launched the guidance for councils. And, you know, it's all about the training and raising awareness among council staff, you know, and that that should be built into training plans. And the councils themselves and the PCSPs came back. Um, through the consultation and said that they were you know, willing to be involved, wanted to be involved in the same way um, through the organised crime um, strategy. They said, well, actually, we could we could be, you know, seeing things and coming across things at local council level that, that other people wouldn't. And we're ideally placed in some cases to um, identify where we think there's, that someone's at risk um, of, you know, modern slavery or human trafficking. So it's, a, it's about ensuring that we work collectively with our district councils and Nilga um, in that capacity, yeah, so it's, it's probably just maybe somebody's, you know, it's, it's use of language. Yeah. No, thank you, much appreciated. That's me, Chair. All right, thank you, Rachel. Um, I know, Gemma, you had your hand up at one stage, but it's down again, so... Um, no, Chair, my, my questions have been answered, thank you. Okay, great. And I think, Sinead, yeah, your hand's down now. Okay, well then, there's nobody else. Um, at this stage, so um, Cathy and Sinead, thank you very much. So, but one of the questions I was going to, to just ask that in terms of getting sight of uh, the, the kind of final version just before it's published, because there's obviously a, quite a bit there where you've indicated it's going to be updated to reflect some of the issues that we've talked about. Um, and I think it would be useful if the committee was able to get um, the, the next version just before you produce that final one in case there's anything that members wanted to to take a look at again. Um, obviously, I think the travel of direction is there. Um, that, that is going to be supported. But if, if we are able to get sight of an updated version before the final one is produced, I think if, if we could get that as a written submission to allow us just to take a quick look at it, I think that would be a value. Could that be accommodated if we were to ask for that? Absolutely, that's no problem. We welcome that because we'll try and reflect on today's session as well and some of the you know the points that have been raised, and try even if we can't address it in you know a, a one year strategy going forward that we put a marker down for what we intend to do in the, in the longer term strategy. And I think that would be really helpful for us, you know, in term in in terms of agreeing with the committee, you know, that the the points that have been raised through the consultation and today that we have reflected them appropriately in the finalised. Person. Yes, there's no problem in doing that. Okay, great. No, that, that'll be very helpful. So, listen, th thank you both very much. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, members, and um, I know the clerk has taken note of some of those points that have been raised earlier. So, um, if members are content, we will 
raise them directly with the department as well and seek a response to those. Okay, I, item six then, members, is the damages return investment bill, consideration of the committee timetable. It's pages 237 to 241. Um, members will know the, uh, the bill passed second stage on Tuesday. It's then uh, been referred to the committee to complete the committee stage. Um, the committee obviously is going to need to discuss the appropriate time scale within which this should be undertaken. Um, obviously, the minister has set out her view in respect uh, of the passage of the bill uh, in terms of trying to complete this before the summer recess and in order to achieve that uh, the committee stage needs to be completed by the 30th of April. Um, so the papers um, is a memo from the clerk. It sets out a number of the issues that the committee may wish to factor into its considerations in terms of the time scale for the committee stage of the bill. The 30 days provided for understanding order 33-2 for the committee to complete the committee stage of the bill um, will end on Thursday the 6th of May, um, but members are aware that a motion then can be brought to the Assembly seeking an extension to this date as has occurred in other bills that the committee is uh, scrutinising. Um, so members, the, the paper um, obviously was alluded to verbally in a previous meeting, it's now there in black and white for members to consider. I know I don't need to say this, and nobody has asked this, but I didn't write this paper and had no role in writing it at all and didn't seek any changes to it, so it's not my paper. Uh, and I know nobody has asked for that, but I'm just being fully transparent um, and open about that uh, in respect of it. Um, so uh, obviously I can invite Christine to, to go through it if she wishes or if members need to, um, but pretty clear in terms of what it's saying. So I'm happy to take feedback from members um, in respect of this. I, I have my own view in terms of the process, uh, and I said it in the Assembly. Um, I want to expedite this as quickly as possible, um, but that is not, in my view, possible within the normal confines of um, doing this within those 30 days. I don't believe it's achievable, and I think it's now clear what the consequences to the committee and the risks that the committee exposes itself to in trying uh, to seek that, um, and we should be building in as much flexibility uh, as possible, as we have done on the stocking bill, where the committee agreed uh, an extension to the 9th of December, uh, albeit that was caveated that we would wish to expedite it uh, more quickly than that, if that is necessary, and I take the same approach to this bill, that I would want to expedite it more quickly. Um, but. We need to build in that flexibility, and I wouldn't want to put uh, a restriction on that that I don't believe is achievable and subject to the kind of risks that are outlined in this paper. Um, so if, if members, for the benefit of the discussion, want my opinion on this, uh, I would struggle to provide an alternative date than the one that we took forward on the stocking bill, which was the 9th of December, and I would be proposing that that should be the same date that we seek an extension to this piece of legislation, but on the basis as was that one, that we expedited as quickly as possible uh, and do that um, before that date. Um, but that gives us um, the flexibility that I think that we need to do. So that's my position in, in respect of it. I'm happy to take feedback from members. Um, Linda Dillon. Thanks, Chair. Um, I agree that, you know, when you look at the paper, there isn't a potential to do this in the 30 days and I think we we had that conversation and, and made all our points on on Tuesday in the chamber so I'm content that you know we're not in a position as a committee to do that by the end of April however I am not sure that we need to seek an extension to December and I would be keen to hear the the view of other members of the committee in, in relation to this if, if there is an overwhelming view that it, it will be sought that we, that we seek an extension to December, then I mean, I'm not going to probably push it to a vote, but I certainly think that um, we could do this, in my view, a little more, um, a little quicker or a little more speedily than that. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Um, part of the, the context for me, I suppose, saying that, in order for this to be done before the summer recess, the committee would need to do it within the 30 days. And if we're not able to do it within the 30 days, 
then we're not going to be able to pass this legislation before the summer recess. So therefore that takes us into the September, October domain before you're going to get to your final stage of a consideration. So if the principle is identified that we can't do this within the normal 30 days, the default consequence of that is you can't then do this in terms of passing the bill before the summer recess. Um, so that's not to say the 9th of December is the date in which I would want to have this finished by way of the committee scrutiny stage, but not doing it within 30 days automatically is going to take us into September, October before we finish our processes. Um, can I bring in Rachel Woods to see your hands up there? Right, Chair, sorry, it's just to clarify more on process. Um, I, I made myself very clear in the chamber. I have no intention of delaying this any further than it, you know, or, or actually delaying it at all, but given it actually the scrutiny that it, I believe that I need um, on the bill. So I'm just wanting on process, and it's maybe because I haven't been through this a lot yet, but is the 9th of December, if it's not the 30 days, is the 9th of December the next logical date? Or is that in line just with the one that we passed with the stocking bill? So I'll let Christine comment on that, but it would be the same principle on the um, stocking bill. You know, that is the final date by which the committee would have to produce its report, but that is not the date in terms of that's when we're going to do it by. The committee can do it more quickly than that. That's just the, the kind of, to, to, to borrow a phrase, the backstop by where, where <laughs> it has to be done. Okay. Um, Christine, um, if you want to comment on that, as long as I've got that right. Yes, Chair. Um, it's really up to the committee to decide what length of time it wants to take or thinks it needs to take to scrutinise this bill properly. But I suppose it is within the context of the other bills that are all in committee. Um, whatever date that you decide, assuming it's more than the 30 days, the motion goes in front of the Assembly, but then we need to deliver by that date. So um, I suppose it's set out in the paper. Um, the shorter the period of time you decide you want for this bill, it will impact on the work on other bills because it doesn't. We won't have the flexibility then just to manage everything the way you may want to. Um, so, for example, if you go for um, a reasonably short period for this bill, that could then impact on the commitment reform bill. We already have a date for that of the 11th of June, um, and we've got to bring it in by then. So it, it really just depends. It's just the impact of managing each of the bills and the shorter the time scale for each that we have, then we have to concentrate on those particular bills and, if you like, um, park the other bills and maybe not do anything on them until we get finished a particular bill. Um, so uh, that's, that's the impact of whatever time scale you set. No, thank you, Christine. Appreciate that. It was just to see if there was a... If I standing order or something that dictated the dates um but it is entirely up to the committee no that's fine chair um only, thank you yeah, the only standing order is it's the 30 days to start with that's that's what the committee has with the option of putting down a motion to extend okay Th thank you um Shanir bradley thank you chair can you hear me okay yes we can Thank you. Um, yeah, Chair, you know, I, I didn't want to see this happen within the 30 days. I'll be open and honest about that. Um, and, and I know others in the committee did too, um, if it was achievable. And I'm looking at the the paper. Thank you, Christine, for that. And it's it's clear to see that there's little, there's little room for us to do it well in 30 days um, as much as we want to. But I think it probably then, you know, at the back of my mind, always in this issue, running through the back of my mind, is there's, there are victims waiting on this. And I think it's, you know, their heart would sink if they see an extension date, uh, which is so far away. And I understand, you know, from what you're saying, uh, Cherry, you've explained it well, that that would be the date we would hope to have it done by. And I do wonder, is there some middle ground in this where we we know that's the date we want to have it done by, but could there be a more ambitious date that we could perhaps um, set ourselves that 
will give us a bit more um, time, but would also not compromise any other work we're doing, but would be more timely than perhaps the end of the year, um, as we're suggesting here. I just don't know if it's a possibility. You know, rather than talking to the very end date, maybe talking to a more aspirational date prior to that. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, Sinead. Um, I've Paul through, and then I'll go to Doug Brady. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yep. And again, you'll all know my views on this. Uh, it's just a principle as much as anything else. I just don't believe the standing orders for committee stage is adequate enough. I don't believe that any committee could do the job that's required on any bill, depending on its content, uh, despite its, or irrespective of its content, in 30 days. And that's why all or most committees seek an extension, which is quite within their rights. Uh, so I don't believe that any committee could do a bill, scrutinise a bill properly in 30 days. And that's not only to scrutinise and get, gain e uh, evidence, uh, uh, actually instil those evidence sessions into the diary. Then you have to go through physically the, the presentations. You then have to, the staff have to report on that. Uh, and then we have to go through clause by clause consideration. Uh, it's just not possible, I believe, to do your job properly in 30 days. So in that regard, I think we should aim for an extension. Uh, then there, there's a certain pressure of time on that because you have a certain amount of days to do to seek an extension. Then you have to ask for the, you have to consider the date because the date, that new date, whatever the extension will be that you request, is the date then that is the deadline. It, it, it now. What I think we as a committee should be doing is inputting into that uh, flexibility. This is pro. This is the only. Uh, pro this is only part of the process that we have control over with regards to time. Every other aspect and leg of this journey is the minister's discretion. So I think we need to be responsible for what is our own destiny in this regard. Uh, so I would be keen to and to add as much flexibility as possible. Having said all, of, and remember, of course, it's not just this bill we're looking at. We're looking at the other two bills and possibly a third bill on top of this uh, coming forward soon. Uh, the minister has promised. So to me, it's about as much flexibility as possible, but trying to push uh, the consideration stage out as quickly and as diligently as possible. So. I think we need to be careful that we set a date in the future that gives us that scope and flexibility, but do everything in our power to bring that in a lot sooner. Uh, but what I don't want to do is bring that date too close to the point where it really does put pressure on everyone, including staff, uh, and then us not function properly as a as a committee, not because of the staff pressures, but because of us not being able to do our job properly in a timely fashion. And then that has a knock-on effect, a domino effect on the other three bills that we will be scrutinising also. Um, because once this legislation is set, it's set sometimes for a very long time, so we need to make sure we get it right first time round. So I, I'm not so bothered about the date that we request I think 100% we, we, we request the extension. I'm not so bothered about the date that we put in that. I think that we, it should be far enough in the future that will give us the flexibility. I think we can explain that to the House and I think we can explain that to all the interest, interested parties within that, that will be affected by this bill and that we reassure those people that we will try and get this pushed through as quickly as possible, doing our job in a, the appropriate way. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, Doug Beatty. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I mean, it's yeah, it 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 really is a procedural thing, and it, and it, and it's quite interesting. I mean, like Linda and Sinead, I've I've got to say, I I balk a little bit at the date of the 9th of December. It just seems such a long uh, way away, uh, and I know it's a as, it's an outlying target date, and I I understand that. But it, but it also strikes me as a target date, which then may well 
force the minister to have to strike an interim rate because, and I don't know this, and maybe um, Christine can answer, if we finish our committee stage on the 9th of December, when is this actually going to finish its its its, its passage? So I, I, I'm really minded to try and do it quicker and set a target which which is challenging, uh, but but is achievable. And I'm always mindful, actually, that I don't think the issue is us. Uh, I think the issue and all of the work sits um, on our secretariat and in, in, in Christine's team uh, and how much work they have to do. And, and as Chrissy's quite rightly said, it's hard to do these sequentially. She has to stop and focus on one, um, even though we may be running four all at the same time. So I, one of the questions I need to ask is, is there any scope within the system for us to request extra resource uh, in Ulster to bolster Christine's team to help with this very heavy um, amount of work that we've got to do. And if and in doing that, and if we got agreement to get that resource increase, can we then set uh, a committee stage, uh, which, which 30 days won't work clearly, but something in the region of, of 120 days? Um, you know, f four months uh, in order to get, in order to not force the minister having to strike an interim rate uh, and try to get us to an end state an awful lot quicker. So there's a couple of questions, I suppose, in there, and I, I don't know if they can be answered, but certainly that extra resource it can't, can't be beyond uh, the, the, the possibility of getting an extra resource in to assist with this heavy workload. Thank you, Doug. Christy, do you want to comment on getting more resources? Um, well, um, I suppose the committee can request if they so wish. Um, my understanding is that we don't have any additional resources available um, at the minute. They're still going through recruitment exercises for some of the grades. Um, people are on temporary promotion already um, and there are gaps. Um, we're using agency staff, so I don't think... Um, there's an obvious um, resource pool that we could use, but um, we can explore if the committee so wishes. Um, I think the other issue for us probably is that the resource to do it in that sort of time scale you're talking about, Doug, needs to be experienced and know how to do committee stage bills. Um, and we have not very much experience across the Secretariat at the minute um, in those sorts of areas. So to find... Um, people who have experience and can do it without being trained and guided in it, which would take time and um, could be the other challenge. My, my, so, thank you, yes, Chair. Thank you, Chair. If I could just jump back. And Christine, you're absolutely right. And there's some of these things which I will never understand how it, how it works. Um, and, and you're the subject matter expert in, in regards to that. Uh, and like Linda, I don't want to force us to a vote. I want to come up with something that's, that's amicable. I mean, I, I, I want to work on this. I want to get this done. I want to achieve this because victims need us to do this quickly. Uh, and what I don't want to do is, is to strike and somebody are being forced to strike an interim rate um, because we put a date of the 9th of December, but then we're able to finish it an awful lot earlier. So uh, I, I just want to make sure that what we do is, is stable, it's not combative, but it's conducive to making sure that we're scrutinizing the bill properly and at the right level for the right uh, reasons. I, I won't force, force a vote on this, of course not, but I, you know, I, I just want to make sure that my views are on record. Yeah, okay. Um, and Gemma Dolan and then Paul Frey again. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And I'm going to raise a different issue um, than the timing. Just, we all received the ABI, ABI um, briefing prior to the second stage, um, and they say that the proposed investment portfolio is too cautious and needs to be amended. So could we get a view from the department whether the proposed investment portfolio is accurate? Yeah, we, we, we can do that. Um, I, have, I, have no, I have no problem in seeking that view, Gemma. I suppose it, it speaks to my wider point that that ability to get that, if we constrain ourselves to 30 days, which nobody is now actually saying wouldn't allow us to do that really um, because of the time frame, but I know nobody is actually recommending that we actually do comply with that 30-day request um, so but yes christine's taken a note of that and we can seek information on this 
Paul. Yeah, j just I, I focused my, con my the content of my comments on to this actual committee. Uh, Doug asked those questions and he was right to do so, but I think he put the clerk in a very uncomfortable position. <laughs> so if I can add to that, I know for, for a fact, and Gemma will know, that the Finance Committee is also looking at a work programme of three legislative pieces. Uh, I suspect that all the committees at the end of this term will be looking at at least one, two, three, or even four bills per department uh, coming up to the business end of, a, of the term. So there's, not, there's no capacity even within the Secretariat at present to move even people about, and that's the experienced people. Uh, you start to bring people in, uh, second them in, then that in itself will probably apply further pressure and other difficulties. Um, so I would I would caution against you know being able to uh, subcontract uh, manpower in on bills and reporting and scrutinising. So it's just it's just this this will happen inevitably at the end of every single term, uh, and that in itself just brings massive pressure. Um, not least in this term, not at least that we'll have three to four bills, finance the same, and then I would suggest to all the other committees. So there isn't there isn't that flexibility in moving people about uh, that you might have in, in other fields or uh, other trades. So we we are, you know, we have what we have, and, and I don't think we can expand on that. So that in itself brings the further pressure and the reason why we really need flexibility in this system at the committee stage. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I know from the chair liaison group, I hear it from other chairs of committees that talk about not having enough resources and the executive office co committee complains regularly about all of their Brexit scrutiny work and um, they were given a priority actually within that forum to get additional resources. I'm not sure if they actually did, but it's something that I hear from other chairs of committees that speak about that. Uh, uh, like we, we have the miscellaneous justice bill based on what the minister said, supposed to be coming to us um, in six weeks' time. And in taking decisions around this, bear in mind the end of the mandate. So uh, the more we prioritise bills, then we're going to be seeking to push out, for example, our work on the miscellaneous justice bill. So we've got the stocking bill and the middle of December is the date that the committee went for on an extension to that. Um, when we get the miscellaneous justice bill, in all likelihood, we're heading into the to the next year, um, and we're going to have an election and the dissolving of this mandate, and so we're we are going to be heavily engaged in this. And if it was only an issue of us members meeting more often, um, I, I don't think anybody would object to that. That's not where the pressure is. The pressure is in the ability to call for evidence, to schedule that, to write it up to then produce the reports, for members to ask their questions, then to seek departmental responses. And all of that is on a very small secretariat. And the risks are highlighted in the, the papers around this in terms of pressures and workload. And, and again, if we say, well, let, let's sit throughout the summer recess, I have no problem doing that. But it does fly in the face of the rules around this place where staff have built up significant amount of leave and don't have an opportunity to take it whenever we're sitting and meeting. And even at that, the summer will be used to be writing up a lot of reports to enable us to hit the ground running in September. So this is why it's it's a lot more difficult for committees than what was presented by the minister whenever she spoke to this. Um, I, I'm suggesting the same date as the stocking bill because I also think we as a committee need to provide a defensible reason as to why we're going to prioritise this bill, but yet we're going to put out the date for the stocking piece and those that are subject to stocking, and that would stay at the 9th of December. But we will give a prioritisation to this bill, and, that's, and I think we could do that. Um, but we're going to then have to provide a defensible reason where victims of stalking don't, don't turn around and say, well, you chose to prioritise something else, uh, and as a result, this piece of legislation won't actually be able to be expedited more quickly. So all of that is just balancing you know, the basis on which we take decisions um, in respect of this. 
So uh, it's not that I'm opposed to looking at a date earlier than the 9th of December, but it does leave us vulnerable to people that may say that means you're not giving the same priority to the victims of the stalking bill. And, and that's why I've suggested that date. Um, Le Linda, and then I think Sinead, you're, you're wanting to come back in. Just a couple of things, Chair. I, I think probably in fairness, saying that we want to, to get this legislation dealt with quicker doesn't mean we're prioritising it over the stalking bill because I would be of the view that I would like to get this dealt with so that I can focus very much on the stalking bill. And so how quickly you do something does not necessarily relate to how, how you prioritise it. But that, that's, that's, you know, I suppose that's an issue for us to to consider our sales. I would like a view from Christine. I accept actually everything in terms of the the staffing levels and I have heard a number of people talking about um, you know, doing meetings over the summer, which absolutely, you know, I signed up to be an elected representative and it's a twenty four seven, seven day a week, three hundred and sixty five days of the year, three hundred and sixty six on a leap year. There is no day off. That is that is the, that is what we signed up to, but the staff who work for us are entitled to a life. They're entitled to a family life, as you've already said. They've built up significant leave, and that's because they haven't taken their leave. That means they're not having that family life, and I'm certainly not prepared to to do anything which further impacts on that. They they are entitled to their holidays and deserve their holidays, and they do not get a choice. If we decide to meet in the middle of the summer, they have to be there in order to, to serve us and I mean obviously they, they can take their holidays but we know and we've seen from, from the dedicated staff on this committee and other committees that they don't. If we say we're coming in they're there for us and, and I just want to place on record our thanks to them for what they have done in terms of helping us to, to get through the legislation so far. But if Christine could give me a view of if we were to set an earlier date, so if we were to set a date, and, and I'm certainly not, um, and I don't think anybody at this stage is advocating for the 30 days because we, we've seen by the paper that's, you know, that's in, in our um, pack that it's just not feasible. That's, I accept that fully. But what, I suppose I'm trying to tie, tie down, what is a feasible date? If we were to ask for a, a closer date, what is feasible? You know, Doug has talked about 120 days I don't know whether that is feasible, so I'm asking for the advice on what is feasible in, in the view of, of the clerk and even yourself, Jaron. I know you've stated your reasons for the 9th of December and you may, you may not want to give me what's feasible outside of that, but if I can ask Christine for that. Sure, no, I have no problem with, with Christine giving a view on it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it Whatever the committee decides it wants to do with this bill, the staff will support that. Um, I suppose it's just the implications for the other bills um, and the other pieces of work. Um, I suppose your options are, if you're ruling out your 30 days, I think probably your options are whether you try to bring in before summer recess or you go for something like bringing in before Halloween recess um, as possible dates. Um, if you go for trying to bring the bill in before summer recess, then I think, to be frank, we will concentrate on this bill and the Committal Reform Bill because it has to be brought in by the 11th of June. Um, we're already aware there's an LCM coming that has to be dealt with. There'll be subordinate legislation um, and there's budget and PFG work. Um, and the likelihood is that for us to bring in the two bills before summer recess, then we wouldn't be able to do very much else, to be honest. Um, work-wise and we would probably we've already gone out for the call for evidence on the stalking bill but I don't think we would have the capacity to look at those um, submissions coming in and put out the issues um, or start making arrangements for that until after the summer if you go for a Halloween recess then I think we can look at balancing and trying to move on I think the other major um, piece of work for us will be the miscellaneous provisions bill because it covers yeah. such a wide range of areas. The key stakeholder list will be very large um, and there's an awful lot of work for staff in putting out that call for evidence and getting the letters out. Um, you're talking about days, I've got staff tied up um, putting out hundreds of letters um, to key stakeholders, making sure the addresses are right, making sure that the names are right, the right people are getting them. 
Um, and if we're trying to bring in the other two bills before summer, then I think there will be that will be very difficult for us to get that out. Um, if you go for Halloween recess then, or just before Halloween recess, then I think there is capacity for us to try and manage that as well, and at least get the call for evidence out on that bill, so that we've got the written submissions back and we're ready to go uh, and take that forward. But at the end of the day, it's it's really it's up to the committee to decide. We will support whatever the committee decides um, it wants to do. But I think realistically, it's just the shorter. If you go for it before the summer or bring it in by summer, then it will impact on our ability to do much or if anything at all on the other two bills. Um, if we go for a bit more flexibility, then I think that does give us some um, opportunity. Um, Doug's suggestion, think of 120 days, I'm not sure, that probably that's what, about four months, that's mm -hmm. virtually into summer recess, I mean that's sort of the beginning of the summer recess. Um, as I say, it's, it's quite difficult as well to know with this one until we go out, I mean we're, we were, we're trying to look that's at a more targeted stakeholder list um, and we're not sure of the interest and if there's, it's likely I would have thought to be fairly specialised interest in it which would reduce the number. Having said mm -hmm. that, we have looked at the consultations that were done in Scotland and England and Wales, and they did attract quite a range of um, organisations that, that you might not have expected were interested in it. Um, but it is hard to know until you see just what you're getting back, um, you know, just the volume and the issues coming out of it um, and what needs to be explored. OK, Christine, I appreciate the view. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Linda. Um, Sinead. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Christine. Um, I'm about to say this, and I mean it with absolutely no disrespect to the Executive Office or the Minister or you, Chair, or the D Deputy Chair, but there's only one person I will listen to regarding capacity of this committee, and that is our clerk, Christine, and I think she steered us right and well and we should all have an ear to what she says and I want to thank Linda for asking the question because that's what I did intend to come in with was to ask uh, the clerk where there was perhaps scope and I think to be fair to Doug Beatty I think it was the resource question was a reasonable one it should never have gone unasked but mm -hmm. I think we do realise that um, resource is an issue across and, and I think that's always the case when it comes towards the end of a mandate but particularly this one given that uh, the Assembly was down for so long. So based on that and, and I'm like others I, I would rather we find a resolution to this together and uh, from what I'm here Christine and I would like that assurance for Lynn, all the reasons Linda pointed out that anything that you would be presenting as a possibility does include you and all your staff around you having that time that you so rightly deserve and particularly with the year that's in it I think everybody needs to to look after themselves and take a bit of headspace so you know I wouldn't want to be putting any pressure on you or the staff um, in any way that would infringe on those holiday entitlements so if that proposal for the um, Halloween sort of recess did account for every staff member having the time off that they need, I would suggest that is something we as a committee should be considering. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Shania. Um, do, you, do you know, Christine, what dates I don't have the Halloween recess dates in terms of storming? We don't know what they are. I'm assuming that's sometime around the end of October-ish. Um, yeah, I think... I'm not sure if it's actually been confirmed yet, um, but there, it's normally towards the end of October. Okay. Um, we'd have to just double check. I'm not sure that we actually have the recess dates confirmed, but it's usually around about that time. Okay. Well, we, 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 can, we can check, I suppose, precisely what the date is, because that'll, that'll form what committee in motion may well be. Um, and obviously, I am keen that you know, we reach a committee position on it. And, and Sinead is right not to necessarily take my position on it. And I would never wish to impose that on a committee. That's not my place to do it. Um, so, you know, obviously, if and I'm reading into what the clerk is indicating that if Halloween, if we're able to complete this report 
um, before we break for the Halloween recess. Um, if that is something that we're able to do, then you know, if, if that's where the consensus is on the committee, I, I'm prepared to go with that as well uh, in terms of what my own view on it would be. Um, so if, if we do have a consensus on that, that we seek to get this extension um, so that our work is completed before we would break for the Halloween recess, we could confirm what that date is um, and, and work towards that. Is there any, any? Sure, I'm agreeing. I agree to that. Okay. Yeah, agreed. Or that session. Okay, Doug. Yes, no, absolutely agreed. And, and apologies um, to, to Christine if I put her in any awkward position. <laughs> okay, well then, listen, if, if we're content, um, we, we will proceed then on that basis um, around a, a committee motion for extension um, to complete our work before we would the assembly breaks for the Halloween recess. We'll confirm just what that date is. Christine, do you want, will, we, will we bring that back next week just to formally ratify that? Yes, if the committee's content, we'll bring that back next week with the proposed um, timetable um, and a stakeholder list for agreement so that we can go out um, and start seeking written evidence, etc. So we'll bring all of that back next week. Okay. Okay. Well, then, if, I think we've consensus on that to proceed in that way forward. And, and thank you, members, for, for engaging around this area in the way that we did. So I appreciate that. We'll formalise things then at our meeting next week. Okay, then the other issue, um, Gemma, we've taken note of that and, and we can get that actioned um, before next week, but we'll, we'll find that information out from the department as well. Okay, um, agenda item seven. This is the commencement of Northern Ireland provisions of the Criminal Finances Act 2017. Um, the Department has provided a written briefing paper on the outcome of the consultation on three updated draft codes of practice and one new draft code of practice under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 to reflect the future commencement of the relevant provisions of the Criminal Finances Act 2017. Um, an update on the position regarding commencement of the provisions in the 2017 uh, Criminal Finances Act by the Home Secretary has also been provided. So the responses to the consultation supported the changes highlighted in the three updated codes and the draft new code, with no adverse impacts identified and no amendments being suggested. Uh, many ch minor changes have, however, been made to the Department's uh, Section 377ZA Investigations Code to reflect amendments made to the equivalent Home Office Code of Practice following the outcome of the separate Home Office consultation. Uh, the updates provide clarity where it is considered necessary but are not considered to be material to the operation of the Code. The Department has therefore made the same amendments to its Code of Practice and an updated version with the changes highlighted has been provided in the pack. So it's subject to committee agreement. The Department will then bring forward draft affirmative uh, orders accompanying the SL1s and finalise draft codes of practice to the committee for approval and laying in the Assembly after the Easter recess. The Department must also commence a small number of sections of the CFA 2017 Act by regulation and a further SL1 on this will also be brought to the committee in due course. So it's, if members uh, are content to note the outcome of the consultation exercise and the proposed next steps, uh, and obviously then that comes back to the committee um, for positions to be taken on it, unless there's further clarity that people need in advance of that, we will then note it. Okay, noted. Um, item eight is the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. At last week's meeting, the committee considered information provided by the Minister on recent developments in relation to this scheme, including the appointment of the President and members of the uh, Victims Payments Board. The application process and meetings to secure funding for the scheme payments members discussed a wide range of potential actions that it may wish to take forward in relation to this and agreed that the clerk would liaise with the clerk to the committee for the executive regarding what uh, engagement and work streams it is undertaking in order to avoid any overlap and duplication of work. So the clerk's paper sets out that the executive committee has discussed the estimated costs of the scheme with relevant officials and has requested additional information from the executive office covering the areas discussed by uh, committee members last week. It also confirms that the executive office committee 
has not met with the reference group comprising of the various victims' representative groups, and there is currently no proposal um, for it to do so. The paper also highlights that the Committee for Finance has asked the Executive Office for a copy of the Government Actuaries Department report on estimated costs of uh, the scheme. So, if members are content for arrangements to be made, um, we will hold an informal meeting with the reference group that comprises the various victims' uh, representative groups to hear directly from them and to give an opportunity to raise any issues or concerns that they may have. And If members are also content, we will write and ask the Committee for the Executive Office to provide a copy of the responses um, from the Executive Office to its request for further information on the estimated costs of the scheme when they are received, and also we will write to the Committee for Finance asking for a copy of the Government Actuaries Department report when it receives it from the Executive Office. And again, members, if you are content, we will ask the Minister of Justice for an update um, following any further meetings that have taken place with the Secretary of State. So, um, Linda Dillon. No, I actually put my hand up, oh, Chair, okay, before sorry. you outlined. No, no, it was just before you had outlined it, and I'm happy that it's covered. I just wanted to make sure that the, the, the meeting, but it was in the paper anyway. I just was wanting to confirm that we're definitely going to go ahead and do that. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, so then, members, if we're content, we'll action that item as outlined. And then, agenda item nine is the correspondence section. There's seven items of correspondence, pages 511 to 585. And then there was two further items of correspondence in the tabled pack. And I'll draw attention to three of those items and then one in the tabled pack. Um, so, just it's item two on the correspondence is the first one I'll, I'll highlight. That's a response providing. The information requested by the Committee on the Political Parties and All Party Groups contacted as part of the Gillen Review Implementation Team scoping exercise to ascertain the policy position on relationship and sex education in schools and the recommendations in the review relating to education and awareness. The review team has written to the political parties represented it on the Executive and to Assembly Committees and indicated that members of all other Assembly parties um, were consulted via correspondence sent to the All Party Groups. Is what they have indicated. So I'm um, not sure if writing to all party groups is the way you would qualify for engaging with all political parties. So um, Rachel Woods. And Thank you, Chair. Pretty good words right out of my mouth. Um, all party groups, as far as I can gather, don't have any statutory um, or you know, there are no powers officially. And it, whilst they're good to get different political parties, not all political parties are represented on all, all party groups. Indeed, I think I'm a member of 13 of them, um, given that we have two MLAs and the likes of Mr. Carroll and Mr. Alistair as well couldn't possibly be on all, all party groups um, in relation to this. Um, I'm not too sure if all party groups are are a way of consulting with all political parties. I'd certainly recommend that it, if there's going to be consultation with political parties, that the political parties are written to and consulted with. Um, I'm sure there is plenty of information online about how you can get in contact with political parties, um, even via the MLAs that are represented in the Assembly um, by them. So I'm not too sure how I feel about that response. Um, and certainly, um, I, I'm happy to, to take it up with um, with the department on, on that myself, um, as it's mostly myself that it affects um, in this case. But certainly, I, I don't really think that that is an appropriate way of consulting with political parties represented in the assembly. Well, I, I would agree, and I'm actually I'm happy if the committee was happy that we would raise that as a committee. Um, representation, um, because it's the first I've seen that response. So I'm always worried about precedents being set um, that that aren't really appropriate. But um, Linda, I see your hand is up. I'm not sure if that's on this or from before, but Linda Dillon. No, again, it was before, Chair. You, you proposed that we should do it as a committee. I I entirely agree. We should do it as a committee. And and while Rachel might might feel that because it's a small party, but obviously even as individual MLAs, we we attend the all-party groups that are brief and probably don't have the capacity to do any more than that. So I don't think it's the appropriate way to do it. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. Well, okay. Thank you. We'll do that then. Um, 
Then item three in the correspondence, it's an update on the funding arrangements for the regional support hubs beyond the current agreed three-year contribution by the department. And the department has now agreed to provide further funding for 2021-22 and all future funding decisions beyond 2021-22 are subject to then funding uh, being available. So if members are content, we'll forward a copy of their correspondence to the police board given its interest in the matter. Um, Chair? Yes, Linda? Can I come in on that? Um, I'm, not, I'm not really happy with some of the stuff in it, to be perfectly honest with you. And I mean, I'm happy for it to be passed on to the policing board and let them take it up. But I mean, the talk about it be, them being subsumed by the PCSPs based on a conversation with PCSP managers, with the greatest respect to PCSP managers, because many of them are very, very good at what they do. And I have great relationship with our own PCSP manager here and, and find her extremely helpful. She is not the PCSP. She is a PCSP manager. So I, I, I'm a wee bit concerned that this seems to be the approach that's being taken, not only by DOJ, but particularly by DOJ, that when they um, consult with or have a conversation or a meeting with the PCSP manager, that's the same as, as consulting with or having a conversation with the PCSP, and it is not. And I think we need to make that point very clearly. And if that's the road we're going down, what is the value of having all of those people who give up their time, um, political representatives and independents on our PCSPs who have a genuine reason for being on the PCSP in the first place? They're there for they're there for many different reasons, coming from many different backgrounds and looking at it from many different angles. And they have, you know, clear views on some of the issues. And I just think that it's not good enough. It's not good enough and I would like it placed on the record and I would actually like a question to go to DOJ in relation to that from ourselves. But I'm, I'm more than content that it's it's forwarded on to the um, policing board because I'm sure that there'll be members within, within the policing board that will have be of the same view. Okay, Linda, Paul Free. Yeah, I would agree with what Linda has said there 100%. But also I would add to that in that this is wider, the support hubs is wider even than the PS, PCSPs and that it takes in the local government uh, and the whole sphere of things. And it's the local government that sees these things on the ground and how the support hubs actually benefits and assists them in their work and the wider work with regards to the partnership agencies. And I think through memory it was a council who wrote to us first as a committee on this issue. Uh, I think now it may have been Midney Stantrum, I might be wrong on that with my own. But I think it was Midney Stantrum that wrote to the U Chair, first of all, on mm -hmm. this. So I think maybe we should pass this on to all councils as well as the policing board, uh, and maybe even ask or invite their views on it. Uh, I'm glad that the funding has been secured, but again, these these groups and these support hubs need long term confidence uh, because some of the some of the work that they're doing is is long term stuff. It's 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 stuff that well, there'll be a benefit from uh, not just now in the immediate sense, but later on in life and later on in the years. So. I think they need support and confidence that the funding and support is going to be there for them as they continue this work, because this isn't stuff you can just turn off and on like a tap. I'll leave it there, Chair. OK, well, listen, we'll, we'll, let, let's write... Uh, I'm happy that we would write the DOJ indicating our um, unease with um, taking a um, manager of the PCAP's uh, input as being representative of the PCSP if it hasn't indeed had that engagement or endorsement of local PCSPs. I think that's appropriate that we would flag that up and then we'll send this correspondence to the policing board and then the policing board may wish to, to pursue the matter um, in, a, in a wider direction with all of its PCSPs and councils and so on. So are members content we proceed on that basis? Okay. Yes, sure. Um, item seven of in terms of correspondence, and I know this was touched on last week. And um, there's correspondence from um, Jeffrey Donaldson MP on behalf of an individual regarding the need for a change to legislation that enables an inquest to be conducted by a coroner's court in Northern Ireland in circumstances where a Northern Ireland resident is deceased overseas and their remains are returned uh, to the United Kingdom. So uh, Jeffrey has asked that the committee would also raise this matter. 
and to seek an update on the current position and encourage the Minister to introduce the amendment needed to the 1959 Act. Um, last week, I think it was Linda had raised this, um, but the committee has agreed to seek an update on progress by the working group established to explore the implications for the justice system uh, in Northern Ireland of commencing Section 49.1 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009, which would amend Section 13 of the Coroners Act uh, of 1959 that would allow a coroner to hold an inquest into a death abroad where the body has been repatriated and is lying in Northern Ireland. Um, so. Uh, we, we can uh, write back to, to Geoffrey indicating that the committee um, has requested an update on the issue and then um, the committee can consider the matter uh, once we are in receipt of that information. I, I met with Geoffrey and um, the constituent along with, um, she's, a, she's actually a, a North Belfast um, citizen and met with um, the MP for that area as well, John Finucane, and, um, and we talked about this case. Um, so to me, this seems strange as to why we still haven't been able to rectify it. I think we're the only part of these islands where this is the case. Uh, and if it's about commencing a provision of existing primary legislation, it, it really shouldn't be that difficult. So I'm certainly keen to get a resolution to this. Um, and when we get an update then back from the department, uh, based upon last week's request, which relates to this from Geoffrey, we'll, we'll pick the issue up again at that stage. Um, Okay, then item eight is uh, correspondence from the Lord Chief Justice advising of his intention to retire at the end of August this year and has outlined the process for filling that vacancy. So arrangements are trying to be made um, for the Lord Chief Justice to attend a meeting of the committee before the summer recess. And uh, I think it would be good to have that opportunity. Um, so if we can note the correspondence and um, we should be able to have that meeting before he retires. Are members content to action then the rest of the correspondence as outlined in the clerk's memo? Agreed. Um, just a chairman's business, only one item. Um, the Northern Ireland Retired uh, Prison Officers Fellowship have asked for a meeting with myself and my role as chairman of the committee to discuss some issues. And it's just to let the committee know that uh, I've agreed to do that and arrangements are being made for this to take place and then I'll provide an update as to, to what those issues are um, to the committee in, in due course. Is there any other business members need to raise? If there's... Chair. Yes, sorry. Chair. Sorry, yeah. Linda. Um, t two issues, Chair. One is a funding issue for um, restorative justice groups for, for CRJ and for alternatives. And this is an issue that's been raised with, with me by, by both in relation to a withdrawal of funding. And I would like to ask the minister to give us a ra rationale behind that withdrawal for funding. And, and it's, it's very much based on the same issue that I have around the, the, the hubs. We ever, at every meeting, and no later than, um, no earlier than last week, we had discussed the need for around the restorative justice piece and around you know prevention and early intervention and alternative you know alternative routes to deal with with issues outside of going into the prison system and yet we have two examples this week one around the hubs where it just looks like they're not seen for the value that I believe they do bring I know from my time on the, the policing board um the value that we were being told constantly by the PSNA that they brought in terms of bringing all of the all of the agencies together and dealing particularly with people with mental health issues, and here again we have um, an instance where funding is being removed from restorative justice. And as I say, we got a good briefing last week on the importance of restorative justice. To me, that just does not make sense. It's either a priority or it's not. So I want to know from the department: is it or is it not? And the last item, Chair, then, is there is a petition by Women's Aid on violence against women and girls strategy. It's something that I know has been raised in this committee by, before by other members. I know um, both Rachel and Sinead had both raised it, both in the committee and in the chamber. And I think, in my view, that there would be fairly good support within the committee. I don't want to speak for all of you. Maybe that's not the case for everybody. But the Minister has also indicated that 
she is supportive of of a violence against women and girls strategy so i would like to write to the minister as a committee and ask what steps she plans to take in terms of proceeding with the strategy okay i'm um, rachel woods on the same thanks this i suppose come in on the restorative justice piece um, I had written to the Minister on behalf of Alternatives and um, Community Restorative Justice Ireland um, just to discuss the funding cuts um, on the 5th of March, it was last week. I haven't had a response from um, the department yet and I believe that the two um, organisations have also written to the department and the Minister on this so um, I'm just sort of declaring that but I would be absolutely in support of the committee requesting information. Um, it's my understanding that the funding is being cut by 50%. Um, now I would certainly welcome some more more information on that and, and just how much of an equality impact assessment has been done on that given um, with with our young people, that, that would be working with young people as a, at the moment. Um, I'm certainly happy to continue talking about the need for a violence against women and girls strategy. That's not a problem. Um, I'll I'll leave it there before I go off on one. Paul uh, Frew was aware of my comments on Tuesday's all party group, so I'll not uh, repeat them. Yes, okay, and and that's that's invited Paul through. Yeah, just just because it would be we, it would be remiss of us uh, for the people who did attend, and me being chairperson, not to raise it that uh, Women's Aid spoke at that all party working group and really did push, uh, you know, for this. Uh, so it is it is a massive issue for a lot of people, and again, I think we should be exploring it and pushing it and see where we can get with it because there are a lot of people out there who need support in this regard. Uh, and the other issue that was raised, uh, uh, just to, for awareness, was the the the, uh, the trusted position piece and the legislation going through GB with regards to uh, someone in a privileged or trusted position, like a sports coach. Uh, I can't remember the other element, uh, Rachel. Maybe you could help me out in that. But it was a sports coach, and there was another aspect of a trust religious leaders Paul Religi with, um, sorry for interrupting yeah. you religious leaders thank you very much Rachel because it completely slipped my mind uh, and those are two uh, trusted positions that are being looked at with regards to legislation now I do believe that should be widened out uh, and I do believe that this legislation should be adopted here and it would be interesting to know even if if how an LCM would work uh, with that piece of legislation how you, you get to to, to a position where an LCM uh, should be adopted. I'm not sure whether that's Westminster's position or whether that's the Justice Minister requesting that. I can't remember, and I don't know for sure. Maybe that's something that we could explore as a committee. Okay, so if members are content, then we'll raise those two issues with the Department of Justice in terms of um, the restorative justice projects and then the uh, strategy that uh, Women's Aid are pushing the petition on. Um, members agreed? agreed? Agreed. Okay, then if there's no further business from any members, then um, the next meeting is Thursday the 18th of March at 2pm and then that will be in the Senate Chamber and obviously the Starleaf facility will be available for members that wish to participate through that medium. Okay, members, so thank you very much for your um, participation today. The meeting is adjourned. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.